Hey, welcome everyone to uh, today's City Council meeting on Tuesday, August the 15th. Uh, Council just had a uh, in-camera session and uh, we do have another in-camera session but we're going to save it till later in the agenda, respectful of everyone's time. I do want to apologize for the late start. I was at a big announcement in Hamilton uh, regarding the Grey Cup and Niagara Falls co-hosting the event this year. So I will uh, indulge you a little later on during the mayor's remarks, everyone's favorite part of the meeting. But before we do, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Sandy Byrne, who will be uh, leading us in singing the national anthem. So Sandy, thank you for being here in person. Sandy's a member of our accessibility committee, and she has been since the 1970s. You'll remember that she's graced us with the national anthem last year as well and did a terrific job. Sandy's tirelessly been involved in bettering the community since her days with Sandy's Uniform Boutique on Queen Street. She headed up promotion of the downtown for several years. She was an integral part in bringing Niagara Cheravan to life, and she still always gives me updates on the Cheravan whenever uh, we're together. She's volunteered with the Winter Festival of Lights for many years. She's currently representing Niagara Falls through her work with the ODA, the Ontario Ontarians, with Disabilities Act. Sandy loves to sing, and she's been active in her choir for years, including at her own church, Holy Trinity in Chippewa. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Sandy Bird to sing O Canada. If I, before I start to sing this, I've got some terrible news, and there's a good chance we're going to be using our church the end of November. There just isn't the financing. So I think I'll be very glad to come out, but I'm switching churches and I'll be going down to Christ Church. Well, that's good. That's close by City Hall. Yeah, well, that's true. That's good news of the bad news, yes. You're still able to hit those high notes, it seems, with no effort. You did us proud, and we want to say thank you very much. We appreciate you sharing your talent with us. It's thank you very much, Sandy. Well done. Thank you. And Sandy, you're welcome to stick around. It's going to be an exciting meeting, I'm sure. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, is the land acknowledgement and tradi traditional indigenous meeting opening. And I'd like to invite Chief R. Stacy LaForme, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, to share his testimony as we acknowledge and thank the indigenous peoples who are stewards of this land for a millennia before us. We're grateful together for the land we share. Me, Gima, Chief R. Stacy LaForme. Mississaugas is a credit. I'd like to acknowledge the creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Anishinaabe. The treaties with the Mississaugas are the Niagara Treaty of 1781 and the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792. I would also like to acknowledge the Treaty of 1764 that recognized the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which set a new relationship between the Indigenous people and the Crown. Kimagwich Bumpi. 
Thank you, Chief. We're grateful for the land that we share. Moving along in our agenda. Um, Mr. Clerk, did you want to comment on the in-camera session? Yeah, the resolution there today uh, is uh, still in place, so we could go ahead and pass that resolution now. As you mentioned, uh, for the sake of uh, the timing of the agenda, uh, it would be most beneficial probably to go in camera right after the planning matters. <clears throat> so after uh, section seven, before section eight on reports, but we can feel free to go ahead and pass that resolution now. Okay, looking for motion, uh, Councillor Lococo, seconded by Councillor Thompson. This is the motion for when we go in camera. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that is approved. Thank you for that. Uh, looking for an adoption of the minutes from our July 11th meeting. Uh, moved by Councillor Neustag, seconded by uh, Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Are there any disclosures of a pecuniary interest? Okay, looks like we're not. That's great. Thank you for, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, Councillor Patel. Oh, yeah, okay. Did you want to uh, state it, like, for the record? Yes, for the Grand Niagara. I'm sorry, I'm not ready for that. Okay, no, no, you know, when you're ready, we'll come back to it, no problem. Okay, moving along, you'll have time now because this is the mayor's uh, announcements and no one really pays attention when I do this, so this will be perfect timing to make your notes. Um, so starting off with obituaries, our sympathies go to the families of Zilpha Dark, Mother of Trent Dark, our Director of Human Resources. Uh, the passing of Vince Cuviello, retired city employee. Derek Tidd, our former town crier. And the passing of Pam Jones, sister of retired mayor and CAO's office employee, Kathy Crabb. We are celebrating some birthdays. Heather Ruslo of our city clerk's office. Her birthday was Sunday, August the 6th. Uh, Heather, give a wave so everybody knows it's your, it was your birthday. That same day was Councillor Strange's uh, on the 6th as well. The following day on the 7th was Gerald Spencer, a manager of municipal enforcement. And coming up on the 23rd of August will be Councillor Wayne Campbell. So we wish everybody happy birthdays. The Niagara Malayali Association's tug of war competition took place recently at Fireman's Park. And uh, was what an event just to watch these these guys pull on this rope and they had a special sidewalk put in for tug of wars. So I think they're gonna be hosting a lot of different tug of wars for, for the days to come. And I was joined by counselors Patel, Peter Angelo and Strange that day for that event. Uh, we had the Children's Memorial Walkway ribbon cutting recently also at Fireman's Park. I was joined by counselors Thompson, Strange, Lococo, Peter Angelo and Uistag and that day, and, and Councillor uh, Patel, I'm sorry, and Councillor Patel, um, that day uh, we dedicated the special memorial garden. This was an idea brought forward by Councillor Strange and Peter Angelo for anyone who's lost a child. For anyone who's ever lost a child, it's a, it's a horrible suffering that they go through. And this is a place that you can reflect. Uh, you can sponsor a bench, rocks, trees, butterfly bushes, pollinator gardens, something that'll attract butterflies. And uh, one of the families uh, that were heavily involved, the Misk family, who lost their daughter, Julianne, and uh, it was a real interesting, neat thing. They released butterflies at one point, and, their butter and she, they said, dedicate your butterfly to your child as they released them. And the Misk's uh, butterfly flew up, and someone caught it on video, and it flew right over to Julianne's um, stone and her marker, and it flew over the crowd and landed exactly on that spot, sat there for a few seconds, and then flew away. It was pretty special, pretty touching. You couldn't script something like that. So this would be a great place for people mourning and uh, an opportunity to be gathered with others and to reflect and think about all the beautiful memories that they have. The first of its kind in Canada, the way it's been done. So we're proud of, of this part of one of our parks. Also, we had a very big event, the, the groundbreaking of the new hospital, the South Niagara Hospital. Very, very uh, big event. And um, I think we've got a few pictures there, hopefully. Uh, I was joined that day by Councillor Neustag, Patel, Baldinelli, Strange, and I think, and Councillor Lococo, and Councillor Lococo, I don't know if I missed anybody. Um, it was a very big day. This is gonna be a 3.6 expenditure to build, design, and operate our hospital in Niagara Falls. 
Uh, Niagara Falls has got one of the oldest, and Councillor Thompson too, my apologies, and Councillor Thompson. Uh, we've got some staff on holidays and we don't have everything all um, uh, as tidy as it should be. But we, um, we're thrilled because we've got uh, the third oldest population in the country, second oldest in Ontario, and it's gonna be, there'll be a focus on many things, including seniors. This will be a center of excellence. It's gonna service Niagara Falls. Our old hospital was from 1958. And the nice thing about this is it's gonna have be the latest, greatest, newest with all the latest innovation. It's gonna have the, the best and newest equipment. It's gonna attract the brightest and best medical minds. And the outcome is gonna be the best healthcare for everybody who lives here. So we're thrilled and it's also gonna be a catalyst for many other things. We've got a lot of doctors and science groups setting up shop here. It's gonna tie in with our new university, with their, with their bio program. Their biomedical program is gonna to work together hand in glove with the hospital. It's all gonna to come together nicely and it's gonna to lead to a lot of excellent growth and um, um, growth and, and R&D in regard to the, to the medical field. So we're very, very excited. Also, we had Step Up for Ukraine. Um, we had the Ukrainians do a bike ride, raising money for everybody in, uh, in Ukraine, and uh, happy to be a part of that at St. Mary's Church on Main Street. We have uh, had our annual commemorative service for the Battle of Lundy's Lane, uh, and, uh, and again, in, in an important place, Niagara Falls, well, it was and is the site of the bloodiest battle ever fought on Canadian soil, the Battle of Lundy's Lane, and many notables are buried in that cemetery, including Laura Secord. We did give the, C, the, the key to the city recently to Frank Dancevic uh, as he brought the Davis Cup here to Niagara Falls. First time in history that Canada has ever won the Davis Cup. Of course, Frank is from Niagara Falls. He was the captain of the team. Uh, they had an amazing showing. They had to beat out in the end Australia to win. And since 1900, this is the first time the Cup came here to Niagara and into Canada and we were thrilled and I had asked them originally if they could just bring it to Niagara Falls that same day. I didn't realize the rich history of tennis in Niagara on the Lake and then they showed me the cup. I didn't realize it. it's about 400 pounds. It's the biggest cup in sporting in the world and uh, not easy to throw in the trunk of your car. So we're grateful to recognize uh, one of Niagara Falls great athletes doing great things around the world making us proud. We also had Niagara Fiesta Extravaganza and um, this took place at Fireman's Park, and I was joined by councillors Strange, Patel, Neustag, Lococo, and do I have everybody? Okay, all right, I think I got everybody. Okay, that took place at Fireman's Park. We celebrated all things Filipino. It was a great day, lots of picture taking, lots of food, and uh, they do such a great job when they use Fireman's Park that I was told by the SCVFA that the park is cleaner after their events than even when they get there. So it was a great weekend event. It continues to grow. We are joined by the Council General uh, of the Philippines and uh, it was a pretty exciting event that we had as well as the first Filipino Member of Parliament Minister uh, who also joined us from Streetsville in Mississauga. Um, and last off, we had a fundraising send off for Councillor Strange and Peter Angelo we're hoping that they're gonna be able to join us by Zoom in our meeting. Today, of course, they're running across the Bruce Trail. Uh, they're gonna be running 30 kilometers a day for 30 days, raising money for childhood cancer. And uh, I know that uh, the cell service is sketchy at best, so they're hoping to join us at one point today. I know they were running, and I was texting with them early this morning, and we weren't sure how it was gonna play out. So hopefully joining us uh, later on and uh, we we're thrilled that they had their event and I know we were joined that day by Councillor Patel and Neustag uh, and myself I was there and uh, Councillor Baldinelli am I right yes you were there too and all I need is a nod and then I know I'll include you I'm looking at you guys give me some indication just to remind me so thank you for that and good luck to the guys uh, we wish them well and hopefully uh, no injuries no snakes and all the other things that are going to be along the trail also, I'd like to thank Councillor Patel for representing the city at Ruffin's Pet Center's grand opening. We did have a lot of grand openings and business happenings. Sobeys had their grand reopening. Uh, that was a big day. I was joined by Councillors uh, Patel and Neustag that morning, early in the morning, 7.15. So uh, happy to see the, uh, the refresh and the rebranding. Sobeys looks terrific. Also, we had Roots and Blooms Flower Shop in Chippewa right in uh, Cummings Square, and I was joined by Councillors Baldinelli, Patel, 
and Lococo. I got them all. Okay, good. Uh, and uh, pretty exciting, and I see a lot of energy in that uh, in that room of this new floral shop. Uh, also, we had Just Be Strong Incorporated uh, grand opening. We had a bunch of um, strong men, strong women competitions, lifting crazy amounts of weights. I was joined by Councillors Patel and Newestag that day as well. So uh, some exciting stuff. Also, we've invited some of them to come to the mayor's first annual charity picnic, which is going to be on the 10th of September, Sunday, September the 10th, at the Serbian Hall. And uh, some of them are going to be pulling one of our fire trucks. So we're going to see uh, how heavy a fire truck really is. Also, we had the Pie Guys second location grand opening on Thorold, or McLeod Road. I was joined by Councillors Patel, a newest egg, and Baldinelli. And uh, we're really excited about these guys. They're doing quite well with their business. And uh, it's obvious how busy they were. It was hard to do the grand opening because the phones just kept ringing. We also had the grand uh, rebranding of Rona Plus, which was the Lowe's. And um, I was joined by Councillors Patel and Newestag on the grand rebranding of Rona at the uh, location of QEW and McLeod Road. We also had the grand opening of the Niagara Parks pop-up store in Fallsview Casino. So that was uh, a first and we're really excited these two big brands of the casino and the Niagara Parks coming together. And lastly, yesterday we did have the neighborhood barber shop and shave parlor opened up. I was joined by Councillor Patel and Baldinelli as uh, we were taking a little bit off the bottom of MPP Gates. He did offer, I did offer, if uh, he would shave his mustache, I would make the first donation, and he said, not a chance. Uh, but he did allow it a little bit off the back of his hair. And our next city council meeting will be Tuesday, September the 12th. And as a reminder, please mark it in your calendars, um, uh, September, Sunday, September the 10th, from noon until four at the Serbian grounds on Montrose Road. We're inviting one and all to come out. It'll be a, a, a free admission, and it will be a fundraiser for a hospital and hospice. So anyone that wants to come out, any of the sales will be barbecue, all day entertainment, bouncy castle, face painting, you know, all the usual things, plus a lot of surprises that we're not gonna let out of the bag quite yet. So definitely wanna show, put that day aside. It'll be a lot of fun and for a really good cause. So that, pardon me? Oh my gosh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. I just left the um, big announcement in Hamilton at their um, uh, museum, and um, this year's Grey Cup is gonna be hosted by Hamilton along with Niagara Falls. So we are gonna host the CFL Awards, which are gonna take place first with a reception at the Avalon, and then a major event with entertainment at the OLG stage. The 5,000 seat stage, they were very excited. It was quite buzz in the air, and today was the first announcement. So uh, what's gonna happen, they're gonna have free shuttle every day between Niagara Falls and Hamilton. You'll be able to go back and forth. You won't have to worry about renting a car, tracking down a bus, or drinking and driving. Uh, they've got so many festivities planned out for all around downtown Hamilton. It is quite exciting, and of course, part of the, the Grey Cup week will take place in Niagara Falls with the CFL Awards. There'll be a lot of dignitaries, special entertainment, and the way I explained it, I said the meat and the potatoes will still be offered in the hammer, but dessert and ice wine will be offered in Niagara Falls. And of course, Niagara Falls is where 90% of Canada's ice wine is made. We thought this would be the appropriate place to have the event. So we're trying to elevate it to another level. A lot of people will travel from the West Coast, the East Coast, and North to come to this event, and what a great excuse where you can take in Niagara Falls and the Grey Cup, the 110th Grey Cup. So we're hoping that this will be the biggest they've ever had with the most interest and, and the high tide's gonna rise all the boats. So everybody in Hamilton, I can tell you, was really excited that we'll be participating with them. So moving on, thanks for the reminder, Mr. Clerk. So first, oh, and I wanna go back, yes, Councilor Patel. Yes, your, uh, your disclosure of pecuniary interest. Uh, before I say that today is the 77th Independence Day for India. So I would like to wish everybody celebrating Happy Independence Day. Thank you for that. And in honor of Independence Day, they actually had a car rally planned from John Allen Park to downtown Niagara Falls and Niagara Parks. And they had 200 cars. They wow. joined the rally. And I was joined by Councilor, Regional Councilor Bob Gill this morning. Okay, so it thank was you. a great event. Thanks for sharing that. That's terrific. And my pecuniary interest is PBD 2023-51. 
my husband's employer will be affected by the development and also the bylaws 2023-079-2023-080. The same reason, my husband's employer will be affected by the development. Okay, thank you for that. And Council Patel, you'll hand that into the clerk and you'll have official written record of your disclosure. Thank you for that. So now we move on to deputations presentations. And first up, we've got Mr. Rocky Vaca of Sullivan Manny. He is here requested to appear as a delegation to speak in regard to bylaw 2023078. Welcome, Mr. Vaca. Good afternoon, your worship, members of council. Um, I was asked by my client to uh, appear just in case you had any questions on this matter or if anyone else appeared to uh, speak against the matter. So that's the only reason for my appearance. Um, I have Matt Kernahan here as well if you have any questions. Uh, but we simply ask that you pass the bylaw unless you have any questions for us. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Baca? I think we're good. Are you gonna be around if there are questions come up later? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. All right. So we move on. Yes, Mr. Mr. Clerk. We do have the bylaw uh, that Mr. Vaca was speaking about listed on the agenda at this time. That'd be bylaw 2023-078. And it might make uh, Mr. Vaca and his clients uh, feel a little more at ease if council went ahead and made a motion to pass that bylaw this time instead of waiting till the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. Uh, so we're looking for a motion to give that bylaw first, second, and third reading. Moved by Councillor Baldinelli, seconded by Councillor Neustag. Do we have any discussion to that? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, and you're done. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, we're, we're a little ahead of schedule then as far as the planning matters, so I would suggest then we go on to, uh, if we, well, we could go in camera right now or go on to reports, one or the other. Um, if we feel that in camera is going to take less than half hour, since the planning public meetings were scheduled to be at 2.30, uh, we could do that at this time. Well, why don't we do that? So look for a motion to go in camera, and uh, motion by Councillor Baldinelli, second by Councillor Neustag. All those in favour? Okay. So what we're going to do, folks, we're going to, we do have an in-camera matter that we need to deal with. It shouldn't take too long. We're going to come back out and resume, and we'll continue on with the planning matters, which are scheduled to start at 2.30. So we've got a little bit of a break if you need to go to the washroom. Thank you very much.
ask you this all the time. Okay, for those uh, participating online or viewing from home, we will uh, start the meeting back up again. And just looking at our WeStream, uh, we're good to go. So we'll have the mayor uh, call the meeting back to order. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So welcome back. We just are about to resume after our in-camera session. So now we are back out in the open, continuing with our regular scheduled meeting. Now we're moving on to our planning portion of the agenda, item 7.1. So I'm gonna ask our city clerk to please introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit the existing three unit dwelling, increase the maximum area of the rear yard and add vacation rental units uh, as a possible use at 5705 Buchanan Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the planning act on July 13th, 2023 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'll now ask Scott Turnbull, Planner 1, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor Diodati, members of council and members of the public. Uh, before council tonight is a proposal to rezone 5705 Buchanan Avenue to permit an existing three unit dwelling and add vacation rental unit as a permitted use. Here we have the location of the subject land identified in yellow. The lands are located on the corner of Forsyth Street and Buchanan Avenue and currently contain an existing three unit dwelling. Directly north of the subject lands is a triplex dwelling, while directly east is a hotel. Properties to the south include a mix of low-rise residential and mixed-use properties, as well as St. Anne Church. Pri properties to the west primarily consist of low-rise residential uses, along with a mixed-use building at the corner of Forsyth Street and Buchanan Avenue. The applicant is proposing to recognize the existing three unit dwelling and add vacation rental unit as a permitted use. Under the city zoning bylaw, vacation rental units require two parking spaces per unit to be provided on site. The applicant has proposed four parking spaces to be provided in the rear yard in tandem and another two tandem spaces off of Buchanan Avenue for a total of six parking spaces for three units. It should be noted that a portion of the dwelling and front porch shown in red on the site plan encroach into the municipal right of way. The applicant will be required to enter into an encroachment agreement. The lands are designated tourist commercial and within the Clifton Hill tourist district under the city's official plan. The existing three unit dwelling and vacation rental units are permitted uses under these designations. The land is currently zoned Deferred Tourist Commercial Zone under Zoning Bylaw 79200. In order to facilitate this proposal, the applicant has requested to rezone the subject lands to a site-specific Deferred Tourist Commercial Zone. The site-specific zoning provisions requested for this proposal are depicted on this slide. Staff are in support of the request to add a three-unit dwelling and vacation rental unit as permitted uses. Staff also support the requested increase to the maximum area of the rear yard, which can be used as parking area. The applicant has also requested that the zoning bylaw amendment permit a zero meter front yard depth and a 0.2 meter exterior side yard width. Staff are unable to support the requested provisions as it would allow for the construction of additions and new structures that would not maintain a suitable front and exterior side yard setback. Instead, staff recommend that the implementing bylaw recognize the existing building on site at the time of application. If future redevel redevelopment or additions to the existing building are proposed, the standard deferred tourist commercial 
uh, provisions would apply. A neighborhood open house was held on July 26, 2023 and was attended by the applicants planners and four members of the public. There was concern raised that this application would lead to a high concentration of vacation rental units. Staff's response is that the intent of the deferred tourist commercial zone and tourist commercial designation that applies to this parcel is to phase in appropriately scaled tourist commercial uses, such as accommodations that minimize impact onto existing land use. There was concern that the vacation rental unit use would generate increased noise, garbage, and a decline in property standards. Staff's response is that the license, licensing bylaw will regulate the operational aspects of the vacation rental unit to control excessive noise, garbage, and property standards. Violations of the bylaw are subject to a penalty, including suspension or revocation of the license to operate a vacation rental unit. There was a comment regarding illegal vacation rental units operating in this area. Staff's response is that the application seeks to permit a legal vacation rental unit use within the existing dwelling that would be subject to the city's licensing bylaw. And finally, there was concern that the proposal would impact property values. Staff's response is that no significant impact to property values is anticipated. In conclusion, staff recommend that council approve zoning by the zoning bylaw amendment application subject to the recommendations contained in staff report PBD 2023-46. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Turnbull? Uh, just asking for clarification, Mr. Turnbull, on the zoning. So this is deferred tourist commercial. So can you maybe explain that to council exactly what that means versus tourist commercial, the word deferred? Uh, definitely, uh, through the mayor to the councillor. Uh, the official plan designation for the property is tourist commercial. However, the uh, zoning category that the subject, that applies to the subject lands is deferred tourist commercial. The intent of that zone as well as the official plan policies that apply to this property is to phase in tourist commercial uses. Uh, in a way that minimizes impact into surrounding land uses. So meaning, so according to the official plan, it's already tourist commercial, but for zoning purposes, it's a transition area, right? It's gonna kind of transitioning toward tourist commercial. So it's gonna be tourist commercial all the way around. It already is in our official plan. It's not residential. Any other questions? Yes, Councilor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor. You said the applicant is asking for 0.0, .0 meter clearance in the front and 0 0.03 meters on the side. What is the purpose for that? What is the applicant planning to do with that? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, the applicants are seeking just to recognize the existing setbacks for the existing building on the property. Um, Staff are, uh, uh, will accept uh, recognizing the existing building. However, the requested zero meter front yard depth and requested 0 0.2 meter exterior side yard depth won't be permitted for the entirety of the parcel. So if they were to uh, build a new structure or addition, they would have to follow the standard deferred tourist commercial uh, provisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Neustag. I think this is um, a, a good use of space. It's zoned tourist commercial location is wonderful. It provides um, diverse uh, supply of accommodation for people who want to uh, uh, travel using uh, vacation rental units. Um, I do um, have concern about the letter that we received from Ms. Salvatore regarding St. Anne's Church. I understand there's bylaws in place um, for these rental regarding noise. Because um, this is a place of worship and people should be free to worship quietly, can we add one more level of um, protection for the church during those times of worship? They, they've identified them, so their um, morning mass times are Saturday evening and their Sunday morning masses. Um, just that extra stipulation that when people come to rent that they understand there is a place of worship and they should not be, um, they should adhere to noise. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, I may defer to uh, General Manager Dolch on this one. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councilor. So that's something that would have to be stipulated in the licensing. Um, that's not something we can control through zoning. We can only control land use, um, hours of operation, those kinds of things are more under the licensing bylaw. Um, and right now, obviously, our licensing bylaw for bed and breakfast, or for uh, vacation rental units are, is already in place. Um, we can you know, look at that, that through licensing. Um, perhaps Mr. Matson can provide some commentary on that. Yeah, it would simply require an amendment to the bylaw. We got that direction from council. Okay, so we can approve it with an amendment for that. Okay, so can I make a motion to? We're not there, oh, we okay. still gotta close the planning meeting, but I can okay. come back to you. All right, thank you. Yep, no problem there. Any, no other, if there's no other questions of council for Mr. Turnbull, Thank you very much, Mr. Turnbull. Members of the public are advised that fail failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per th section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to, pe to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone other than the applicant who wishes to address council on this topic? Yeah, if, yeah, if you'd like to come to the microphone, please, and just stay. <coughs> I got a sore throat. Okay. <coughs> it's not catching. <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. And if you can just um, state your name, please, in your address. Oh, I will. For the um, Thank you. I want to address them here in council. Uh, <coughs> I wrote, an e I wrote a, a short sure. email. <coughs> I want you to understand that I've never done this before and I've never complained very rarely to City Hall about what goes on on Buchanan Avenue, but that house has been in my family for over, I don't know, maybe 70, 100 years. I'm third generation owner. It's a rental. It's a prestige rental inside. Oh, I was this, offered, you I about, want to tell you this for no, a reason. Just before, because procedurally, are you talking about the house that we're talking about? I'm talking about my house, where I live. Oh, so it's not this house? No. Okay, all right, thank you. I live maybe, I don't know, walking distance, and I appreciate that the St. Anne's has talked about noise, but I'm a rental too, and I have had tenants leave because of noise. I, I don't know if you read my little email that I wrote. Uh, maybe you can just highlight it for us. Uh, very briefly, I'm not against progress. I'm not against tourism. I grew up in a tourist area. I worked in tourism. I appreciate people coming from a different country. I don't have a problem with this building on the corner. I have a problem if there's 10 buildings on my street and I think anybody else on my street would have that problem. We didn't pay our taxes for 20, 30 years to be, have a restaurant across the street, a motel down the street, five gas stations on Stanley. I don't call that good planning. So I'm sorry to say that. I'm not trying to be rude. Um, noise is the main concern. You cannot control people that rent in a property, especially being an absentee landlord. I can hear Amax music in the summer because our neighborhood is quiet. Fine that you have a bylaw against noise. I read the vacation rental proposal, but in my personal experience, it doesn't matter what bylaw you have. I've been up sometimes till five and six in the morning listening to the parties in Motel 6 and Comfort Inn, and I know the owners. The police do not respond. During the pandemic, to give you an example, I called the police because it was one in the morning and there was a disco party going on. The late dispatcher said, it's COVID, don't go over there. Because usually I just go over and say, you're going to get a fine, be quiet. She said, don't go. She called the police. She said, there will be an officer. The officer never came. The people left. They weren't even staying at the hotel. So you can have all the bylaws you want, like noise and what's the other garbage, but what, what do we as residents do? 
at three in the morning when there's a wild party going on. We have no recourse. Not only do we not have recourse for that incident, but we have no recourse for any following incidents. So my suggestion maybe is there should be a fine for noise. Somehow. That's the noise part. The garbage part, I know that you will come as a city and take garbage away that has, how about one that was this high and this wide. Finally, the city came, they moved it and they charged the owner. So I'm not saying you're not proactive. I'm just saying it's hard to control when police are busy doing things like car accidents or whatever. Those are my two concerns. Personally, I do think it would drop down my property value a bit depending on the buyer. Because if I sell my home, it's an income property. So maybe another person will want an income property. But if they want to live downstairs like I've done and rent the apartments upstairs, an Airbnb is next door is not going to fly with them. I was in real estate 10 years in Collingwood. I'm not uneducated about purchasing and selling homes. So I'm hoping that the city, because that's all I have to say, will consider the fact that Airbnb or vacation rentals are a great opportunity to promote your city. But if you go through the Airbnbs, nothing on Buchanan Avenue is going to look like the ones in the picture books for Airbnb. So my, I have the same concern as other people. They just don't talk. They don't show up. They just complain. <laughs> is that enough? No, that's great. I'm going to get you, maybe we can get an answer from one of our staff on what happens with noise uh, when it's after hours. I don't know uh, who uh, Mr. Uh, 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 our general manager of planning is going to help us answer that. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the, the delegate. So in terms of our noise bylaw, obviously we have bylaw enforcement that deals with noise matters after hours. Uh, if we don't have anybody on call, obviously you can call the police. Um, in the future, we are looking at an administ administrative monetary penalty system. We're in the works right now with that, creating a bylaw, and it would be more of a fine system. So should there be a noise complaint, and it's a, and it's a recognized noise complaint beyond our bylaw um, parameters, then they could get fined for, for the noise violation. So we are working on that. As you kind of indicated, that would be something you'd be looking for. We are working on that. It's in draft. We've, we're hope, hoping to have it out um, pr probably in and around October. Okay, thank you very much. There's one more thing that's in there about parking. <laughs> Buchanan Avenue, North Street, Forsyth, it's the Wild West. When I bought the house and was permanent at, at my mother's house after they passed, I parked on the street one day because I had a girlfriend staying. She had a real fancy car, I let her park. I got a fine, even though I lived there, $30. Ever since the motel was built, there's no fines. There's, it's, it's the Wild West, people park wherever they want, Overnight, double parking. Aside from that, you're probably not aware, Mr. Mayor, or you are, is that on holiday weekends, I don't know, it was never happening before. And all of a sudden, people figured out that when they go down Stanley, they should go on a side street to avoid the congestion, which creates more congestion. And to give you a purple, a, an answer why I'm so pissed about it, New Year's Eve, I was coming back from St. Catharines. I noticed that there was a lot of traffic, so instead of coming on the 420, I went all the way around Thorolstone. It didn't matter. It took me till 2.30 in the morning to get to my driveway. And at what point, there was a party going on on my driveway in my parking lot, which I read them the riot act, and they told me I was an old lady, and I said, you're right, but I'm strong, and if you don't get off my parking space, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> they left. <laughs> they, were, they were just young kids, right? And I shouldn't have done that, but I was furious. So maybe, especially since you're considering vacation rentals, there should be some sort of awareness, because that was the worst, but it's still bad. 
The other night I couldn't even get into my street. I couldn't, I had to leave my car five blocks away and walk to my house. I pay over $3,000 in taxes. There should be some traffic cops. I don't know, I've ne the Parks Commission has them. I'm, you have no idea how bad this is. Do any of you know how bad it is around that neighborhood? And I know you tried to do a one-way street, and it probably would have solved a lot of problems. <clears throat> it wouldn't have solved my problems because you own up to my porch. <laughs> so you guys have a great day. I could go on and on. I used to be a public speaker, but I'm not doing that well today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions of council? Is there anyone else here other than the applicant who wishes to address council on this matter? Okay. All right, thank you for that. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Hello, oh, welcome. If you'd like to state your name. Yes, uh, hi, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Max Fetishak, and I'm a planner with NPG Planning Solutions, and I will be presenting on behalf of our client uh, in support of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment at, at 5705 Buchanan Avenue. Thank you. So as mentioned by staff, the subject lands are located on the corner of Buchanan Avenue and Forsyth Street and have a lot area of approximately 490 square meters with 15.24 uh, meters of frontage on Buchanan Avenue. The subject lands are designated as tourist commercial in the city's official plan and are zoned deferred tourist commercial in the city's zoning bylaw. The proposal seeks to permit three vacation rental units within the existing three unit dwelling. The two parking spaces on the site will be maintained and an additional four spaces of parking will be added in the rear of the dwelling to uh, <coughs> achieve the requirements in the zoning bylaw. The subject lands are within 650 meters of Clifton Hill and are within 200 meters uh, to many eateries and attractions along Ferry Street. The neighborhood contains a mix of existing multi-unit dwellings, mixed-use buildings, and, a single, and single detached dwellings. Further, the subject lands are adjacent to a six-story hotel on the western property line. The, as mentioned, the subject lands are designated tourist commercial and are within the Clifton Hill Tourist District, which is the focal point for our touristic activities within the city, including tourist accommodations. VRUs are a form of tourist accommodation which is permitted within the tourist commercial designation. The city official plan provides policies establishing a vision for land use within the city and the zoning bylaw is a tool used to Im implement this vision. The intent of the tourist commercial policies applicable to the subject land is to phase in tourist commercial uses in the area that minimize impacts on existing land uses as addressed in policy 4.2.19 of the city's official plan. The VRUs proposed are an appropriate introduction of a tourist commercial use into the deferred tourist commercial, uh, tourist commercial zone. A VRU is a less intensive tourism use compared to uses uh, such as neighboring hotels, motels, and attractions, and is not anticipated to impact ex existing land uses. There is a demand for legal VRUs within the city, and the subject lands are in an ideal location to serve that need. The proposal is appropriately scaled and the dwelling has achieved compatibility with the neighborhood. Uh, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment includes the following site specific provisions, uh, permitting vacation rental units as a permitted use, rec recognizing the existing deficient front yard and side yard width related to the existing dwelling, and permitting an increase to the maximum area a rear yard can be used as parking. Um, the intent of our request is to recognize the existing building and is in line with uh, staff's interpretation. Uh, lastly, the VRU would be subject to the city's licensing bylaw, which gives the city the ability to further regulate and enforce matters such as parking, noise, partying, and waste. 
In conclusion, we believe that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment should be approved as it is consistent with relevant policy, supports the city's tourist district, is located on lands designated for tourist commercial uses, and would be subject to the city's vacation rental unit bylaw. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Fetishek of council? Okay, it looks like we're good. All right, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Okay, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Go to you, uh, Councillor Newsteg, if you'd like. Okay, so I'd like to um, make a motion to move it with the with some sort of um, extra uh, licensing um, regarding the, the noise for the church. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Dolch, if you want to just help us on the wording of that. Uh, during uh, service hours, how we could add that in as an extra bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. I think you'd have to add it um, to the holding provision if you were going to do it. I just did want to caution that, um, uh, obviously, a noise bylaw, and I was just going to quote some sections, it does right now, um, at any time, you can't have persistent yelling, shouting, screaming, whistling, sh anything like that. And in terms of hours, anything beyond 9 p.m. to 7 p.m. the next day, no music, no anything. So we do have, obviously, our noise bylaw that would take care of that. But if you still wanted something in addition to that, then I would just put it, um, add to the holding, then an amendment to um, the licensing bylaw being be included um, in, in the recommendation number two, that the amending zoning bylaw include a holding provision to require, obviously, the encroachment agreement and then uh, in addition to amend the licensing bylaw to restrict uh, noise and put your parameters. During the times of their services, during Sunday, times of Saturday service. night and Sunday morning. And, and also during the week, they have uh, weekday masses as well, so morning. So basically this should be uh, a BRU with very limited um, noise. It should be more or less somebody coming to stay, not to have parties during yep. the day. Yep, okay, so Mr. Clerk, did you, uh, did you get that? Okay. Okay, we've got that. So we've got a motion by Councillor Newesteg, uh, seconded by Councillor Patel. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing yes, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our council has decided to have VRUs in tourist commercial areas, and that's what this is, um, and it's deferred to tourist commercial. So the zoning already allows it. Um, I do think the area w would allow it where it is, and it's unfortunate that the church is there and has these extra challenges. So I'm glad we're looking at those. Um, in, in regards to the concerns from the resident, not only um, can you call in general for the bylaw, but if there's these additional ones. Um, we do have a lot of other vacation rental units that are around places of worship, so maybe we should look at those as well. Um, I, I can think of a few off the top of my head that are, are close there. And um, once it's registered and licensed with the city, um, you can go on the website and it has the owner's name or the um, um, the uh, maintenance person who is in charge so there's an email and a phone number so that will also be be helpful for anybody in the area if there's issues yeah that's a big advantage to them being licensed versus the illegal ones where we don't have contacts so definitely a, a good approach in favor oh, I'm sorry who did oh okay oh Councillor Campbell you're joint you're with us yes oh yeah I'll have been Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know. Okay, well, did you want to comment? I uh, know I, 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 I am in favor. I do have some uh, concerns, especially since I have some VRUs in, um, in my neighborhood. But uh, in this case, I am in favor. Okay, terrific. Okay, that's great. Well, we're gonna call the vote now. Then, all those in favor. Okay, and that's, and I've got you too, Councillor Campbell, so that's unanimous, thank you for that. Okay, thank you folks for coming out, and we are gonna be sensitive to the noise issues, and speci specifically with the church being there, and uh, we're working on, uh, hopefully in October, as our uh, general manager of planning, uh, addressing some of the issues that you're concerned about. So hopefully we're just a couple months away. Thank you for coming, appreciate it. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you introduce the next item on the agenda, please? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a city initiated amend sorry city initiated amendments to the city's official plan. Public notice was given on June 13th, 2023. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan amendment 
or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the City Clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside Council Chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I now call on Brian Dick, our Senior Manager of Policy Planning to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendment. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of council. I have a brief presentation that will introduce the topic. Uh, so this is OPA 157 to the official plan. It's a city initiated amendment to uh, clean up some mapping. So if we proceed. So if you look at, oops. Uh, the first slide, which is just looking, is our location map. So this gives you a general idea of the context of the two areas in consideration for uh, redesignation from industrial to residential. And you can see where they're in context with respect to uh, around the Gale Center. Uh, looking at the first site, this is uh, lands located west of Stanley Avenue. It also consists of Fraser Street and south of George Street and to the immediate west we have uh, the Hydro Canal and Lupazol uh, in Industries. Uh, the total area of this air total area of this site is about 3.8 hectares and also to the south my apologies there is a uh, former rail spur as well as Fairview Cemetery. Uh, second site is just to the southeast of the Gale Center and it's on north of Hamilton Street, lands north of Hamil Hamilton Street, east of 4th Avenue, and it totals approximately 2.5 hectares in size. Uh, so what is the purpose of the amendment? So we're here to investigate the conversion of two industrial uh, sites to a non-industrial use. So we're going from industrial to residential. Uh, the current land use designation industrial is historic in nature, and the current use of the lands, which are primarily single detached housing in a residential setting, long standing and existing, do not really conform to the industrial designation as currently contained in the city's official plan. Uh, so without the conversion, the introduction of an industrial use could potentially cause a future land use conflict. So we thought this would be a good idea to adjust the mapping to reflect the current land uses for the most part. So when we look at what, uh, looking at what are we thinking of changing, we're basically changing Schedule A, which is uh, a la so the Schedule A in the city's official plan, which is the future land use, and we'll just be changing that, like I said before, from industrial to residential. So going from a blue color to a white color. Um, the planning rationale. So these sites, the two sites in, uh, that we're talking about are located outside of an established or proposed employment area. Uh, the sites are relatively removed from surrounding employment lands. Uh, the sites are surrounded by non-employment uses on three sides. Uh, the, converg the conversion would not create an incompatible land use and the conversion would not negatively impact other employment lands in the area. Uh, the conversion would be consistent in support of the city's planning objectives and would also not go against the city's planning objectives. The sites offer limited market choice for future employment development because for the most part they're very small lot sizes. The configuration doesn't relate to what industry is currently looking for and basically market conditions. So if you remember our employment strategy that we came to council with earlier I guess it was 2022. Uh, industry nowadays is looking for large parcels of land strategically located away from uh, nearby residential uses and strategically located along the QEW corridor. Um, also, the sites do not offer potential future expansion on existing or neighboring lands. Uh, so the comments received as of the date of me writing this presentation was there was really no significant concerns raised by members of the public or any of our stakeholder agencies that we circulated to. And just to be, you know, to be out of an abundance of caution, we did want to protect any nearby existing or future industries from any potential land use conflicts. So we uh, added a policy that future residential development shall have regard for the D6 land use compatibility guidelines. 
Uh, so just generally the recommendation that based, uh, council approve official plan number 157 subject to consideration of any public input presented at today's public meeting that being August 15th, 2023. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Any questions for Mr. Dick of council? I guess you did a good job. We're good. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing, dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 17 of the Planning Act. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to, I'm sorry, anyone here who wishes to speak the proposed amendment? And I'll start, okay, we're gonna, if you'd like to step to the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. And then we'll go to our clerk if there's anyone else online that would also wanna address council. We're gonna start with your name and your address, please. Thank you, your worship, uh, esteemed members of council, uh, city staff, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark McAlcoff. I'm the president of Oleo Energy Zinc. We own and operate the former Lubrizol facility located at 5800 Thorold Stone Road. And we have an adjacent rail spur uh, that is uh, immediately to the south of the proposed uh, amendment. So let me tell you a little bit about who I am, what we do, mm -hmm. and why we have concerns with this uh, proposed amendment and redesignation of lands. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we are a manufacturer of lubricants and specialty chemicals. Indeed, we're a growing business. We started out in 2010, and we currently employ over 40 uh, local uh, uh, community members, skilled trades, we have apprentices. We have brought in refugees from war-torn lands and are employing them. The proper use and the protection of the uses of employment lands is paramount to us, our business, and our employees. As a result, we are very concerned when there is any redesignation of any kind of lands in our immediate vicinity that would not be compatible potentially with our uses. Now, we are a chemical manufacturer under the D6 guidelines that uh, were referred to by city staff. Uh, we are a class three facility and that requires significant setbacks and mitigation measures in order to ensure compatible uses and uh, ensure that everybody plays ball together in a sandbox, so to speak. In that regard, we, although we do not produce any kind of obnoxious uh, uh, odors and we don't uh, produce a lot of noise and vibration, we still need to ensure that local residents are not adversely affected by our current uses and our future uses. And just to give you a little background, uh, we started basically from um, a biodiesel firm that we were going down that track and we refocused to traditional lubricants blending. Our customer base now includes various multinational corporations that are shipping larger and larger amounts through our facility and we are producing lubricants and transformer oils Indeed, we are the sole supplier to a large multinational and probably most of the utility scale projects and the nuclear power stations, we've produced the uh, transformer oils for those projects. In that regard, we plan on being around uh, in the Niagara Falls community for a long time into the future, producing lubricants, providing jobs to the community and skilled jobs that are good paying and uh, are not fly by night. Now. We had opportunity to read the report of the city and we believe that it contains certain factual areas um, with regards to uh, the criteria upon which you would base a redesignation. So some of those are in the criteria that is in that report and I know that I don't have a, uh, a visual presentation but if we could get that report on the screen it might help. Now I'm not a planner but uh, is that possible or is that the... I, I think our IT, are we, do we have a copy of the report that we can put back up? If it's too difficult at this juncture, and, and I know it's unannounced, 
It's all right. I can well, I can let's talk see. to it. Are, are, uh, yes. Yeah. Not specifically the presentation, but the written report. Oh, the written report. The written report. Oh, we don't have a. They don't have that. They only have the pr presentation that we saw earlier. Okay, then I can I can simply speak to to some of this. Yeah. Um, uh, during the submission of uh, uh, of the city, it was noted that uh, the uh, lands are there's no immediate employment lands in the area, and I do believe that there are. We have a premier Ferd or Ferdy Tech fertilizer plant that is kitty corner to this parcel that operates an industrial facility. On the north side of the facility, we have uh, several businesses. We have uh, Niagara Tire and Battery, who we use as a supplier, and they service our trucks and provide battery and tire services to us. There are numerous in the area businesses of an industrial nature, whether a transmission repair uh, and, and uh, uh, facility or other uses other than residential. And although it would appear that the presentation show, says that it's primarily residential use currently, that is not indeed the case. If you look on the land, the amount of land that is used in that parcel for employment lands. And there was a, <coughs> a comment that was made that industrial users are looking for large parcels. That is not always the case. There are many <coughs> smaller businesses that uh, are industrial in nature that have smaller amounts of employment but are very necessary to provide services to the community. So on that basis, I believe that the report is somewhat in error, that there's uh, very little industrial use of that parcel in question. So there are several factors here that, that are discussed. Uh, it says the area is surrounded by non-employment land uses on three sides. That would not be the case in this particular instance based on the way that we interpret this. Now, again, I'm not a planner, but um, now the other thing too is us being a class three facility, being a chemical plant, there are, are large setback requirements or in the alternative, mitigation measures that are required to ensure compatibility of uses. So on that basis, um, I would suggest that if there are mitigation measures that have to be put into place, they would severely encroach upon residential, potential residential uses into the future. We went through a uh, similar development or a matter with the land just to the south of us. And as a result, uh, we being the business owner, we had to uh, employ consultants and legal team in order to ensure that mitigation measures were constructed, much to the dismay of the landowner to the south. However, what it does is once that landowner developer is gone, the residents can now feel comfortable that there isn't gonna be excess noise or vibration that is gonna be caused by our plant. So lastly, what I'd like to say to council is I'd like to thank council and the city staff for providing excellent support to business owners like myself to uh, grow and expand our businesses. And I know that we need to keep, continue to work hard to reinvigorate the lands that were formerly industrial and can be good industrial properties once again into the future. So for that reason, we oppose the redesignation of these lands. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Mahalkoff of Council? Okay, looks like you're loud and clear. Thank you very much, appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, and I saw another hand up earlier, someone else other than the applicant who wishes, yep, you can come forward if you like to the microphone. And if you could just state your name and your address, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Frail. I live on 4397 Third Avenue. That's the southwest corner of Third in Hamilton. I was, my family uh, purchased 4380 Third Avenue. That's the northeast corner where I was raised since 1967. So my wife and I bought a house, kitty corner of that. And my sister bought a house two doors down. My cousin bought a house four doors down. So we've been invested in Third Avenue 
uh, pretty much north of Hamilton Street um, for 56 years now. And our concern is, um, again, I get to know all my neighbors. I've been there forever. And I've been talking to people summertime. I'm corner house. They walk by, they walk their dogs. The main concern is we've seen a lot of extra traffic come in since the Gale Center was built. I did come to the meeting here and express that concern. And uh, I had mentioned that I'd just call the police if there's crazy, you know, dangerous driving or anything like that. Well, now that they've built more homes on the old YMCA property, the traffic's even worse. Um, <clears throat> I'm outside all the time with my dogs. We just don't let them out the door. We go outside with our animals and we come back in. Um, sorry, I kind of get upset over this because I watch all the cars go by. Uh, I'd say three out of every five cars don't even live on Third Avenue. But for some reason, they don't like the stop sign. They don't like, they don't like the stop light on Fourth and Bridge. So they whip down Third, whip down Hamilton, and then go back, you know, go the other way, whatever they're doing. Most traffic on Third Avenue is not from the residents. So our fear is that somebody's going to take the property that used to be North End Towing years ago, Coots Library, uh, Sentinel LA, LA Band Lines, and they're going to do what they did to YMCA property. And you see all the housing jammed in that spot? We don't want that. We don't want the extra traffic. I don't, ca I don't care if it goes residential. I want somehow that we can either make sure we have speed bumps put in on Third Avenue, um, access from Fourth and maybe Victoria, but leave Third Avenue the way it's been. Like, we've all invested most of our lives in, on Third Avenue. Most homeowners have been there for at least 15, 20 years, if not some 40 years. That's all, all we ask is the traffic is the main concern. If Third Avenue could be left a dead end like it is, that'd be wonderful. Maybe we, can get, maybe we can get uh, some insight. I don't know if we can. Uh, if you just want to hang tight, Mr. Uh, I don't know, Steph, uh, if I could ask Ms. Dolch, any feedback on the Third Avenue comments from Mr. Frail, from you, or Mr. Billado? I'm not sure if anyone, everyone's looking at their shoes, but uh, if anyone can help me out here. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I can start, and then I'll pass it over to Mr. Billado. Um, but in terms of, obviously, this, this amendment is just to uh, put it into a residential land use designation. Any future development, obviously, we'd look at traffic and things like that, the traffic right. patterns. Once we know what, what's being proposed, this is just generally a land use at this point. I understand. Um, and hopefully, the other thing I was just saying, in terms of uh, the roundabout, hopefully some of that traffic will, uh, once that new section's opened, that cuts, cuts that corner to get right to Thorold Stone Road, hopefully that will assist as well in that meantime. But um, obviously when the development application does come forward, we'll definitely have a look at, at traffic. Uh, we've heard your concerns here tonight. And I don't know if Mr. Billado has any other further questions. The, uh, the conversion isn't expected to generate any additional traffic volumes, um, but I'll, once you're done from the podium, I'll give you my card and we'll speak about some existing uh, concerns in the neighborhood and we'll have a look at it. Thank you. That's great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, yep, I'm going to now. Uh, was there any questions for Mr. Frail of Council? No? Are we got Okay, we're good there. Uh, anyone else other than the app? Yes, yes, you can come forward. Hi, my name is Peter Giblet. My address is on the sign, each, sign in sheet on the outside. I'm a member of the, I'm a licensee of the Law Society, so I cannot put my address online. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and <coughs> Essentially, I'm on Second Avenue, and funnily enough, the the um, plan that was sent out, my garden essentially is chopped in half by this conversion. And essentially, it would be it would be great to know that hey, um, that's going to be residential, but I don't think it changes anything. One of my biggest concerns are here is that, of course north of what is site two on your plan is um is actually land that it was formerly cyanamid land and that land is still as far as we all know is still contaminated as far as i'm concerned the the um commercial properties that are on fourth avenue um there is as far as I know there's not been any testing of that land on Fourth Avenue to know whether that land is safe to be put in as 
um, as residential and rezoned as residential right now. My concern is that we have a repeat of the Love Canal situation and that we put in, we change it to zone it back to residential at this time and then of course fail to do the testing when some applicant comes in in three or four years time or whenever that is and they don't test the land beneath, beneath which they intend to build. And I think that um, it's simple to say that we can remove this from employment lands but it's a lot harder to see how we're going to convert it to um, residential because I think if we look at the outflows from that whole area um, to where you know the, those old maps that I've seen which have got information about where old um, dumping was done and that old dumping is of great concern because when you look at that zone um, which is like that um, I suppose teardrop type z uh, um, shaped zone just to the north of that to zone on site two is actually what um, is actually an old dump site from Cyanamid and um, is I believe even to this day con considered um, contaminated land and that is my biggest concern here is that I don't want to see um, five ten years down the line some child you know being announced on the local on CHCH as dying of cancer living in this area well, let's see if we can get a little insight from our uh, staff on that one. So I don't know, Ms. Dolch, if you can help us out on uh, that uh, aspect of converting to residential, if there is some contaminants there. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I, also, I can start with that definitely. And in terms of splitting your garden, I will uh, ask Mr. Dick to perhaps comment on that. But uh, in terms of the environmental aspects of this, any uh, residential development going forward will have to show how the uh, do a record of site condition. And with that record of site condition, what happens is they have to show that the land is is able to accommodate residential development. So as we go forward, and it's not to say it can't happen, it's how much money it will cost to get it there. Um, so those are the things that, that we look at. I know another site on, on, on 4th Avenue was converted to residential. They did the cleanup. Um, and again, those are, in my mind, good news stories if we can actually get these sites cleaned up uh, versus them sitting as they are. So uh, we do have a brownfield program uh, at the city, so hopefully, uh, you know, developers will take advantage of that, but they will be required because it was formal industrial use going to residential. When they come in for development applications, they will be required to demonstrate how the site is able to be cleaned up to a residential standard. Thank and you. that goes through the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and we'll straighten out your garden. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's the least of my concern. <laughs> is there anyone else other? Yeah, sure, come on forward if you would. Yeah, if you can state your name and your address for the record. Hello, my name is Linda Pope, and this is my husband, Stephen Lucas. We live at 5626 George Street in Niagara Falls, and uh, we've lived there since 2018. So for five years, we have a well-established understanding of what you'll experience having a residence on George Street. So it's our viewpoint that George Street is entirely unsuitable for residential occupancy for two basic reasons. Um, first, we tried to get a mortgage, a residential mortgage with TD on Portage Avenue, and uh, we both have excellent credit ratings and income to support it, and it was rejected. And they, when we asked why, they, we were just told um, the underwriters don't give an, uh, a reason sometimes, so we were perplexed, so we went to CIBC on Huggins Street, filled out the mortgage application, and as soon as the mortgage officer saw it was George C Street, he said, oh, I'm not even going to submit this. You won't qualify for a residential mortgage from any bank because we all know George Street and you won't get a residential mortgage because of all the auto shops on the street. So uh, we were surprised about that. So we went to Meridian Credit Union, since it's not a bank, <laughs> and they're more community-oriented, and uh, we met with the same fate. So 
uh, we thought, uh, let's try someone in Toronto that doesn't know George Street. So we got a letter of commitment from a bank in Toronto for the through a mortgage broker. And uh, when they sent an appraiser and they took pictures of all the auto shops, they withdrew their letter of commitment. And the mortgage broker who had been in business 25 years said he's never once in 25 years seen a letter of commitment given by a bank and then withdrawn once that was shown. So it was clear to us we weren't going to get a residential mortgage. And um, when I stressed for more details, they just said we were too close to the auto shops, even though we're right across the street from Niagara Battery and Tire, and there's a residence and Sam Visca Electric before you get to the next auto shop. That wasn't, that's still too close because they said with these auto shops and doing oil changes and that sort of thing, um, sometimes oil can seep into the ground. They don't want to own a residence that could possibly have these, um, the soil contaminated. So that was, that wasn't, uh, that didn't work for us. Um, and then as, as now that we've lived there for five years, um, we can see that tow trucks are coming at all hours of the day and night along that short street. It is very short. Across the street, we're at the edge, right at the end, against the Welland Canal. Across the street is Niagara Battery and Tire, which takes up the entire block, block until you get to the end, which is a row of plaza businesses with a locksmith and printing company and, um, and a number of businesses. On our side of the street, there's one uh, residence beside us, and then Sam Visca Electric, and then um, there's uh, Niagara auto transmission business which has the contract for the Canada Post vehicles so they're constantly being towed day and night for repair there's pretty much no parking on the street available we all have a driveway for us to park in but it's double and triple parked often because Niagara Battery and Tire runs out of parking and then we have all the tow trucks with the Canada Post vehicles and then there's um, Another small residence, two, two more small residences, and at the end of the street, uh, it used to be a premium used car lot, but that business is different now. It's, the, I guess, a taxi stand. It's, the whole lot is full of um, yellow taxis, so they're driving in and out, changing shifts all day and night. And then also, uh, it is a garage there, and they... Um, regularly stow demolition derby race cars on the lot and after they repair them they drive down up and down George Street to test them out if they're ready for drag strip racing so the few children that live on the street in the apartments above Sam Visca Electric when they try to go out there's there's only asphalt for them to play and they try to play ball in the street and that sort of thing it's impossible and dangerous because of all these tow trucks and uh, drag racing and all kinds of things like that so I can't see that it's suitable at all for um, any residential purposes um, in addition, I think you've already mentioned the environmental aspect of uh, having to test for the soil and for auto businesses that have been there for years would be very expensive, I think, to remediate the soil to bring it up to residential standards. Did you want to say anything more? Okay. Um, I think I think that's um, that's all I wanted to say, except not part of this plan, but a directly perpendicular across Stanley Avenue, there's a large fertilizer plant <laughs> as well. So I would disagree with Mr. Dick's assessment. Perhaps the entire plan is primarily residential, but our street, neither by square footage or the number of lots of how many residences and how many businesses, it is not primarily residential and, and just not suitable. I'd, I'd I'd appreciate if another reassessment or review could be done of it. Okay, thank thank you. you. Thank you for that. Any questions uh, for Ms. Pope? No. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, come forward if you would, please. And state again your name and address. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Aaron Butler. I'm a principal planner with NPG Planning Solutions, Niagara Falls, just on Victoria Avenue. Um, I'm here this evening just to speak to uh, site two. So I think you have separated into site one and site two. Um, I have a client that owns the property at 4280 4th Avenue, which is the former ball hockey uh, property. So it does have most of its frontage is on 4th Avenue. There's a sliver of frontage on 3rd. And um, really the, the, the ball hockey site, 4284th, is largely in a residential area. There are some commercial uses on 4th. And to the north of the property is the former rail corridor. Really south of that rail corridor is the residential neighborhood down to Bridge Street. Um, my client right now is, is in the midst of preparing for a planning application for a residential development. Um, they'd be subject certainly to at least a zoning bylaw amendment. And they're going through um, record of site condition, as Ms. Dolch mentioned. That's required because it used to be a commercial use and it's converted to, uh, proposed to be converted to a residential use. That's required under the record of site condition regulations. Uh, the province has to see that and, and receive that prior to any residential going forward, regardless of, of what happens tonight, uh, today. And I'll just note that, uh, yeah, in addition to the record of site condition, there's also a uh, land use compatibility study. I've, I've heard um, a couple people mention about, you know, the D6 guidelines, noise, uh, air quality. Those studies are also underway to review the, the compatibility of a proposed residential development on the property. And um, I'll just mention that the, the site would be accessed from 4th Avenue. I know there's a concern about uh, 3rd. There's a sliver of, access, of frontage on 3rd Avenue. The, the plan likely is not to access the, the 4284 4th Avenue property from 3rd. And just in summary, I'll just say that uh, I agree with the staff report with respect to site two in particular, um, and um, and certainly supportive of the official plan amendment to convert from employment to residential on that property. Okay, great. Do we have any questions uh, for Mr. Butler of Council? So you're supportive. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone else other than the applicant? Is there anyone else left in the room who hasn't spoken yet? <laughs> and, uh, and I would ask Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone else online? Uh, no, Your Worship, there is no one registered online to speak to this. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so are there any other questions or comments of Council, for, of our staff? Yes, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In the past, we've always been very careful when we um, develop residential uses close to uh, industrial uses. And we have these two industrial, um, Vertitech and uh, Oleo there, and then all the ones on Fraser. I do have a question for Ms. Dolt. On page nine, um, at the bottom of the um, table regarding Ms. Pope and Mr. Lucas's property, the last column says staff will consider however the existing zoning for the subject property will remain in place what is staff considering i i, I was speaking with um mr bryce on the phone the other day and we went through a lot of things and i asked him and he wasn't sure he said he'd get back to me um at the bottom on page nine the table um, it says Linda Pope and Stephen Lucas, 5626. So off to the right, it says staff will consider, however, the z existing zoning for the subject property will remain in place. I don't understand what you're considering. Uh, Maybe Mr. Dick. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank, uh, through the mayor to the councillor, just staff will consider their comment. They made the comment they were concerned about the uh, the mortgage, the lack of getting a mortgage. So just as when we summarize the comments, we have, we'll consider that in the grand scheme of the bigger picture, okay. but we're not touching the zoning. So the prestige industrial zoning will remain in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, and, and I guess maybe um, the question is for, for Ms. Pope. I just want to confirm that the potential contamination is from the auto shops on George, uh, George Street and not 
the cyanamid. If we could maybe bring Ms. Pope back. Sure. Ms. Pope. <clears throat> Is the mic on? Oh. Uh, yes, that's the feedback that I got was the uh, concern was the contamination from the auto shops on George Street. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. And then there's a, by, a deeming bylaw on today's agenda 11.14 uh, for Fraser Street and I was speaking to Mr. Bryce about that as well. So if this goes through then the deeming bylaw for Fraser Street can go through merging two pieces of property and it's, it's industrial, but it could go residential later on. Do I have that correct as well? Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, that's correct. They would obviously need uh, amendments um, as part of that, but yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, yes, Councillor Patel, and then I've got Councillor Thompson. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Dolch. If we change the zoning, what changes okay. for the auto shops in that area? Thank you, thank you. Through your worship to the councillor. So in terms of the, the auto shops, we're not changing the zoning, we're just changing the official plan designation. So nothing changes. And if I may, auto shops are permitted in all commercial zones, all industrial zones. This isn't, this isn't a, a new use. Um, again, they're adjacent to commercial and other areas because obviously they're permitted in commercial zones all across the city. So a, a public a mechanical garage, a service shop, all those are permitted outside of industrial zone in the commercial area. So um, again, nothing will change on this site. They'll remain as uh, an auto body shop or a, a, um, a service center and they can remain as such. The zoning, even if we change the zoning, they're grandfathered in because they're a legal non-conforming use. So they legally have been there um, in the past. It's only if they plan to convert or change the use that they could never go back to an auto body use unless it was commercial. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments of council? Okay, so then I'm gonna close the meeting. The public meeting with respect to the proposed, oh, I'm sorry, did you wanna speak before I do or after I close it? Okay. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan amendment is now concluded. Looking for the will of council, Councillor Thompson. Yes, I in favor of the residential and uh, their houses are, are there and the power canal is and the, a lot of, of distance oleo uh, that wouldn't be in any problem. And we dealt with this uh, previously uh, about um, employment lands, and we told the individual it, it's going to be residential, and that's just um, north of this this property and I'm in favor and we don't it's right up to the cemetery and I wouldn't think we would want to have industrial or there and that's <coughs> where the busiest and vacant sense Senator so I wouldn't think I would make a motion to approve the uh, uh, application. Okay, the recommendation. So we got a motion by Councillor Thompson to approve the two recommendations. Uh, do we have a seconder to, to the motion? Okay, I'll ask one more time. Do we have a seconder to the motion? Okay, so that motion fails. Do we have a follow-up motion of council? Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I put a motion forward that we deny the application. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilor Lococo to deny the or the uh, recommendations. Do we have a seconder? 
I'll second it. Okay. I was going to say, you can't be for it and again, so you got to pick a side. Okay, thank you, Councillor Campbell. So we've got a motion by Councillor Lococo, seconded by Councillor Campbell, that we deny the two recommendations put forward in the report. So we will call the vote. All those in favor of denying the recommendations. Okay? In favor. Okay, so that, that passes. Oh, so man. the two recommendations man. fail. So it's going to remain as it is uh, going forward. Yeah, so everyone yeah, that participated, thank you for your time. Thank you. Meeting where you, you'll have to come. Who's that? It's Wayne Campbell. Oh, okay. <laughs> you guys are too much. Okay. I do have one recommendation. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Clerk. <laughs> Uh, we do have a, an item listed later in the agenda under section 15. Uh, it was motions, and this was a result of the notice of motion from last meeting. Uh, we do have a resident in the gallery that has asked to speak, and I might make the suggestion that uh, section 15 just be moved forward at this time uh, so that uh, we can have that resident speak. Section 15. So which one is that account, uh, Mr. Clerk? Are we talking about the motion, the uh, basic income? Okay. Uh, so we have someone who wishes to speak to the basic income. Mr. Mayor. What I would suggest is that uh, we, if council permits, we would introduce uh, that topic, uh, have the councilor make uh, her short presentation, uh, and then open the floor uh, for the one uh, Request for the deputation. Okay. Yes, Councillor Lococo, did you want to make that motion? Yeah, yes. I, so I'd like to make a motion. I have a, um, a few paragraphs and um, then we can move forward. So, a motion by Councillor Lococo uh, to bring forward item 15 on the agenda. So, we'll need a second. I'll second that motion. Seconded by Councillor Campbell. Is there any discussion to this? Can I please do the presentation first before we discuss it? Uh, I think that will answer a lot of the questions. Well, this is just procedurally to bring it forward. We can't talk about it right now because we're out of order. So we need a motion to bring it forward. Otherwise, we have to follow sequentially oh, through the okay. agenda. Oh, okay. So we're just talking to bring it forward. Sorry. That's all. Okay. That's yeah. all. So do we have anyone to speak to this moving it forward? Okay, then I'll call that vote. All those in favor to move this forward now? In favor. Okay. Oh, we're not even dealing with that. This is just to deal with it now at this point. Okay, so that approves, or that, that's approved, so we're good to deal with the council. Okay, great. On June 7th, 2023, the City of Hamilton approved the concept of a basic income after implementing a pilot program from 2017 to 2019, which changed and saved lives of thousands of low-income vulnerable people. Through addressing poverty and improving access to health care, a guaranteed livable basic income can reduce health care and living costs, enabling people to afford preventive care and timely treatments, preventing more costly health care interventions later, leading to much better overall population health. It can alleviate food and housing insecurity, improve physical and mental health, financial stability, social equality, and greater connection to the labor market. In the past, the concept of basic income has been perceived as a partisan solution. We need to change that. The fact is that many respective conservative thinkers have advocated for it. It should be a nonpartisan solution and we can start by supporting the concept at a local level. Hamilton and 22 other municipalities have supported a basic income at the provincial and federal level. Federally, Senator Kim Pate sponsored Bill S. 233, which will develop a national framework for a guaranteed livable basic income. The bill had its first reading in December of 2021 and was referred to committee in April of 2023. They're waiting for it to come back in the fall. I had the opportunity to speak to Senator Pate and she provided me information regarding the bill. This framework would determine what, constituents, what constitutes a basic income for each region in Canada the goods and services that are necessary to ensure individuals can lead a dignified and healthy life. In 1971, Senator Kroll of the Special Senate Committee on Poverty stated in their report, poverty is the greatest social issue of our time. That was in 1971. 
The report noted that we continue to pour billions of dollars every year into social assistance schemes that treat the symptoms of poverty while we leave the disease untouched. In 2019, 3.7 million people, 10% of Canadians, were struggling below the poverty line. Poverty rates are doubled for persons with disabilities, racialized, and First Nations peoples. Families led by single mothers, especially mothers living with a disability, are three times more likely than the average person to live in poverty. Indigenous children face poverty five times, high, five times higher than the national average. We have dozens of programs that assist local income and vulnerable people. And I'm going to list a bunch of these programs, and this is not a complete list, but I'd like you to think about the money, the administration, and the time that go into all of these programs, that if we looked at a basic, a basic income, some of these programs could be eliminated or um, lessened. Ontario Works, Ontario Disability Support Program, Canada Pension Plan, CPP Disability, CPP Survivors Benefit, CPP Orphan Benefit, Old Age Security, Guaranteed Annual Income System, Trillium Grant, Seniors Care Home Tax, Seniors Homeowner Property Tax, Canada Housing Benefit, Northern Ontario Energy Credit, Ontario Electricity Support Program, Affordable Housing and Homelessness Prevention, Home for Good, Housing First, Bridge Housing, Transition Housing, Advanced Canada Worker Benefits, Grocery Rebate, GST, HST Rebate, Child, uh, Canada Child Benefit, Guaranteed Income, income Supplement, Employment Insurance, the Federal Dental Plan, Climate Action Incentive Plan, CNF, uh, so City of Niagara Falls Property Tax Rate, City of Niagara Falls Water Rebate, Niagara Regional Property Tax Rebate, Medical Expenses, Training Expenses, Education Expenses, Recreation Programs, Geared to Income Rent, Subsidized Rent, Utility Assistance, Transportation Assistance, on your income tax, there's a basic personal amount. Service clubs offer, pr offer programs, food banks, and soup kitchens, etc. You can see through all of these programs, we're trying to assist low income and vulnerable people. A basic income would eliminate or reduce the need for all of these programs, the cost of the programs and the administration. Basic income would be distributing the money that we are already spending in a more effective and efficient manner. I have a short video I'd like to share with you and then I'll wrap up with a couple of comments. Do we have that video? You hear it all the time about people without money. They're just lazy. They should just get a job. The subtext is poor people deserve to be poor. If they just tried harder or made better decisions, they'd make it. But 4.9 million Canadians live in poverty. Is there really what they deserve? The job market is like a game of musical chairs. And since we depend on employment to stay out of poverty, it's like playing over hot coals. Traditional 40 hour week full-time jobs are becoming scarce. Meanwhile, automation is removing chairs from the game. Cars can now drive themselves, but it's not just taxi and truck drivers who should be worried. It's baristas, lawyers, writers, accountants, doctors, musicians, even animators like me. All sorts of jobs will be done in part or entirely by machines, and humans just can't compete with their speed or cost. It should be great that we have more time, but the rules of the game make it an economic nightmare. We made these rules, and we have the power to change them. But if we all had a basic income, it would be an income sufficient to meet basic needs and live with dignity, regardless of work status. It would reduce stress and insecurity and let people focus on the work most important to them and to us all. It would be a floor placed over the hot coals. Now some people worry that if we give out money with no strings attached, people might stop working altogether. Maybe they'll spend it all on drugs or alcohol, or just play video games all day. But why not look at the evidence? Experiments and programs providing direct cash transfers have been conducted all over the world. They show that as people's economic security improves, they continue to work, or start their own businesses. Crime rates drop, health outcomes improve, more people finish school, and people are able to stay housed. Economists from across the political spectrum support different forms of basic income. And what's all everything? But it's the key to making other programs and services work better. When people are desperate, crime goes up, education rates drop, 
and healthcare costs rise. By investing in a basic income, we head off these problems before they start and won't have to worry so much when our jobs can be done by machines. Please add your voice to the growing movement for a basic income in Canada and start conversations with your family, friends, colleagues, and elected representatives. It's time for a basic income guarantee. Thank you. My, my final comments are, as a city, we should recognize the social and economic challenges faced by our residents. During the pandemic, it was stated that 40,000 residents in Niagara Falls rely on the tourist industry for employment. A lot of these positions are seasonal and paying minimum wage. This contributes to inc income equality, poverty, inadequate housing, and precarious employment. The City of Niagara Falls has declared a state of emergency on mental health, homelessness, and addiction on June 21, 2022. Today I am asking our Council to support the concept of a basic income and write a letter to the Prime Minister, local members of Parliament and the Senate, the Premier of Ontario and local members of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario calling on these level of governments to work collaboratively towards implementing a national guaranteed livable basic income to eradicate poverty and homelessness, reduce waste and redundancy in the delivery of social programs and ensure everyone has sufficient income to meet their basic needs. I would second that motion. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so we got a motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Campbell. Discussion now. Uh, Councillor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, I would like to add a friendly amendment to Councillor Lococo's motion. Okay. My, my amendment is to have staff come back with a report outlining the annual file, annual financial impact of this proposal. I do not feel comfortable supporting or voting on this matter without knowing the full financial impact to the taxpayers. We should always be aware of what we are voting for because at the end of the day, it's only one taxpayer and one wallet. Also, secondary reason for, secondary reason for this amendment is for staff to outline the existing programs we have in place that could be enhanced or improved instead of developing a new program. I'm sure Councillor Lococo would want to know the cost too. Uh, thank you for that. So I'll ask Councillor Lococo if you consider that friendly. Uh, no, through the mayor, no I don't. It's not uh, no, part no. of this program. Um, this program would not be administered through the city. It's to support it at a provincial and a federal level. It has nothing to do with the city. Um, staff can come back with a report, but it's only going to be reporting on a provincial or a federal program. It has nothing to do with um, local taxpayers. Yes, it is one taxpayer if you're paying provincially or federally, but it's not including our programs. So what would happen would be we would write the letter to support the idea, and then the federal and the provincial would put programs together to have that. Once they put the programs together, then all of the other programs that I listed, you start to see, oh, I don't need that anymore because people are getting it from a different level. It's not here at the city to be implemented. So I don't see the benefit of our staff coming back to bring a report of a cost because there is no cost at the local level. No, I would like, to, uh, what I'm, I'm proposing is you're saying 1,000 people, so we should know the cost that would, you know, what number of, what's the number for those 1,000 people to implement this pilot project. We have to know the cost. No, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, through the chair, um, I think there's some confusion. It's not a pilot program in Niagara Falls. It was a pilot program in Hamilton that was already done in 2017, 2019. It's not a pilot program. I'm not asking for a pilot program. I'm asking us to write a letter to support the concept of basic income at the provincial and federal level. It has nothing to do with the city of Niagara Falls. It's not a pilot program here. Um, okay, so, and if you want to propose your amendment, we can vote on that if you decide. I mean, we can get some discussion from Council. It's not considered a friendly amendment by the mover. So, uh, Councillor Thompson, you wanted to speak? No, I say second her comments. That's, well, she, not <coughs> what I, that's not what I heard at the start, and I think the CAO, he made his 
comments. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. okay. I would so, like to put a motion in. Okay, so then Councillor Patel is going to move her amendment, and that's seconded by Councillor Thompson. So, yeah. Well, how do we? Yeah, we would we would need to entertain the first motion first, uh, and prior to calling the vote, I remind you again that there's a resident that wants to speak to the matter. Uh, that should be done before the vote is called. And then if that, depending on the outcome of that vote, we could then entertain uh, another motion. Okay, so do you understand that, Councillor? Okay, so we've got a motion on the floor that we've got to deal with right now. Yes, Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just like to inform um, Councillor Patel that's not what this motion is. This motion is not about a pilot program for Niagara Falls. It's not using any of Niagara Falls money. It is asking the provincial and federal government to create programs of a basic income at a provincial and federal level. So to ask staff to come back with, you talked about the thousand, that there is no thousand people. I'm not asking for a pilot program. Pilot programs have already been done. So to me, to bring up that motion, it's with incorrect information. So it, 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 it's opposite to what I'm bringing, completely opposite. Okay. okay. So for that, like, do you have uh, any idea how much it cost in Hamilton? They had a pilot project in Hamilton. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I do not have the numbers and the reason why there's not numbers right now. Um, I could contact Hamilton, but the challenge was it was supposed to be a four or five year program. The, the Liberals put, put the program in and then it was stopped after two years when the, when the Conservatives came in. So there's not accurate data to provide to you. Um, and my intention wasn't to sell you on the, the process of the dollars and cents, it's to write a letter of basic in, income to support it. And what the federal and provincial government will do will be they will look at different, there's different platforms and there's different terminology. Like some people say, everybody should have a basic income, that it's guaranteed, you get it, you get it, you get it, no matter how much money you, you, you have. Other people say, no, that's not the program that I want. If it could only be a certain uh, level of income and then it kicks in. Um, so there's different formats out there and all of the formats are not, um, this is a concept and the provincial and federal governments have to come up with the different concepts that they will put at the federal and provincial level. I'm, I'm not going to create a program, it's not, I, I'm not educated or experienced to create a program to put that together. Um, so as I said, there's 22 municipalities that are supporting this. They did only a two year uh, pilot program. Um, I did include the motion, I don't know if anybody um, watched it, but part of the motion was a link to the Hamilton. Well, that wasn't working, I don't think no, it worked for it anyone. Happen. Oh, it's unfortunate, because if somebody asked me, maybe I could re resend it, but it did work. So it was um, about 20 some minutes um, in the city of Hamilton where they talked about um, why they were doing it. Uh, it was a unanimous vote, it's not my intention to bring the program to you in whole to say approve it or not. The intention is the concept of basic income to write the Prime Minister, Premier, all of those in support of the basic income and once they get enough support from the municipalities they will start putting together all of the numbers. There's, like I said, there's different programs out there try this, do this, what is the certain level, uh, how do people's um, CPP work into it, like there's a whole bunch of them and none of us at this table are, are experienced enough to put that together. I can't put that together for you. Well, my question is because you're supporting this resolution, have you done your research that how much extra is going to cost, for example, if they implement that program in entire Canada? Um, dep again, depending on who you're speaking to, like I gave you all of the, a list of all of those programs, you would reduce those programs and now you reduce the administration cost, you reduce the money going out, you might need certain programs that you need to keep pieces. It, it's impossible to, to say at this point because the City of Niagara Falls has programs, the region has programs, every municipality has their own programs. Then you go to the provincial programs, then you go to the federal programs. So everybody would have to sit there and go through and say, okay, well we need this program, we have to keep it, or we only need a certain part, get rid of this one. There is no clear cost. It's to investigate into the cost. That's what this motion is going to do, is look into all of those costs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Newstead. 
I think we all, um, I don't think there's a person in this room that would not uh, want to try and solve this issue of poverty. But I think it's the methodology in which um, we have to look at it. Um, there's some concerns I have with this um, basic income approach. Um, I've always been one who believes in a hand up, not a hand out. And um, even going back to that parable, you teach someone how to fish, they can feed themselves forever, give them fish for, and they eat for a day. So I don't know if we'd have more money going back into skill or education. So we spend that kind of money, that pool of money that you're speaking of, helping train people, providing more educational um, opportunities for people. Um, also, there's always a fear of people being come dependent on something. We're not encouraging them to, to um, try and do better. And the one thing about trying to amalgamate these other programs, um, dental and all these other things, so we're also making a huge assumption that giving people this money, that they have the financial literacy skills to save the money so that they can um, spend it for dental or other things that right now they can go and get those extra help, the, the extra help for. So. I, I think it would be, I, I'd want to see an awful lot more research going into this before I would ever support something like this because I think doing one thing this way we might be taking and stepping, uh, pulling people back further. So um, I'd be a little reluctant to, um, to support this wholeheartedly without a lot more uh, research done on it. Your Worship. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Uh, yes, Councillor Campbell. I think what this motion is doing is moving it forward so that the federal and the provincial governments do the research and it's going to have to come back to us as a council whether we agree with their results. I think we need to move this forward. There, nothing beats success than success itself. Uh, a lot of these people are on a, a welfare program. Well, if they make too much money, they get uh, deducted from their welfare income. So why would I want to go get a, a job if I'm on welfare, if with the money I make, they're going to take it away from me? Uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense. That's the way the system operates today. Yeah, we're going to, we're, yep, once we hear from everybody. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Coco. I have some of the stats from the Manitoba one. It's not dollar amount, but it's percentages in the surveys. 79% of participants reported improvement of overall health. 82% reported improvements in mental health. 83% per, were better to afford necessary medication. 74% were better able to afford dental care. 50% were able to afford psychotherapy. One third of participants with children reported improvements to children's health. Many reported using health services less often. Um, this was an interesting one. Here's a, a comment, um, a quote from somebody. My confidence boosted the sky high. I took two months to get my, um, my anxiety under control. I found a full-time job in less than two months. My kids' confidence went, went higher. They started bringing home better grades. They have, pay, they have proper winter clothing. They are able to play outside. Basic income made me want to better myself and did. Um, this is not a question about spending more money. It's about question, spending the money differently and more effectively. So I know we have a, a speaker or a, a few speakers, and again, I could agree with Councillor Campbell that it's not for us to figure out all of the details. It's to support the concept of it and let the people who have all of the, uh, the statistics and data to put a program together to be approved later on. Okay, thank you for that. Is there anyone, any else on council before we, before we call on our speaker? Okay, so we'll call on Mr. Clerk. Who do we have? for speaking. Uh, yes, we have uh, Sandra McKinnon who had registered previously to speak to this matter. Okay, thank you for that. Just a reminder that she would have up to five minutes to speak. Welcome, Ms. McKinnon. Welcome, everyone. Um, I um, was here uh, in 2020, March of 2020. That was the first time I spoke at this podium. And it was at the end of the meeting that day, I, would, I came to council because I wanted to know what was going on in this city. So I figured I better come to this, the council and I'll find out what's going on. So I came here and I just, the prior meeting, I sat through that. And then the March one, 
I had the opportunity, he said to myself and another man, um, one of you can speak, but you only got a minute. And he said, well, I'm, mine's gonna take too long. And so I, I grabbed the opportunity and I said, I'll speak for that one minute. And that one minute was about the homeless people in the city and they were living in tents. And I come from a small community in Cape Breton and I've never seen that before. And I'm like, this is a rich place. Why are all these people in tents? What's going on? But anyway, I was referred to two counselors. I spoke to one, that person knows who it is, but um, we didn't get along and it just fanned out. Anyway, that's that part. Um, but I wanted to say that I'm a woman, it's obvious, <laughs> and I'm also a mother of three, and I'm also a grandmother of six, and I have, uh, I'm a friend and I'm a social worker by profession. Um, I wanted to, to share just very quickly that I went into the welfare system in 1995. After 13 years of marriage, our marriage ended and I was left with the three children to raise on my own with $200 support from my ex-husband or partner. So, and I was the first person in my family to actually, you know, go on welfare because my father worked at the steel plant for 40 years and my brother was a military police and my sister was a principal teacher and all those things. So I was the first to go in. Well, I've been in that web in 1995 till right today. I'm still in there and I tried to get out. So I'm here standing in front of you as a social worker I went through six years of university at 41 years of age till 47, graduated, went to a job in Newfoundland, the job fell through, and in 2009, I went from um, graduating May 25th to become a social worker. My son graduated the next month, June 25th, his grade 12, that was the youngest. So then off to Newfoundland we went and I left my apartment and. It was a big uh, kerfuffle with a whatever. I'm not going to get into that kind of stuff, but it just didn't work out. And there was a tribunal, and all these kinds of things happened. And in 2009, what started as a really great year ended with me, with my friend who was an RN, beside me at the welfare office applying for welfare again. So that was in 2009. So, and then after that, I went to Alberta, and things happened there, things happened here, and things are still happening here. I just went through seven months to try and get a position, and I, the welfare would not, the, the ODSP, because that's what I'm on now, they would not give me the $500 admissions money to, to become a social worker. I had to do an exam after the, the meeting a couple of weeks ago, or last month, the 20th, on July 3rd, I did an exam that was a uh, four-hour exam, 170 multiple choice. I failed. I failed the exam. Now, I could have went off on a, you know, a tangent over it, but I didn't. I accepted it. As I've gotten older, I've learned to accept things for what comes our way. One door closes, another door opens. So that's how you know, I feel about that. I feel a lot of people, and just hearing people talk, they, they don't understand. They think that people are out for the money and all that. That's not true. I'm, I wasn't out for the money. I was out for survival. It, it, it wasn't about the money. You know, it was to, to raise my kids. I had to clean houses for the wealthier people and do whatever I could to make ends meet, and that's what I did. You know, and um, I'm very proud of my three children I have right now because they're, they're thriving in Alberta thriving and um, one of the she mentioned a pilot pro project I was part when I went into welfare I didn't want to be there and so they offered a compass program similar to like a pilot project and this um, compass program it was a great idea and it is a great idea to do that so I what you do is you go and you work for say it was long-term care what I went to work for and I was uh, activities a coordinator assistant with the actual person and I trained with her. And I did so well, she put me over in the, into the enriched housing part. But they couldn't hire me because they were like a nonprofit or something like that. And so what happened was um, I left that position um, and then I was offered a position with the Autism Society. 
And I was ecstatic. I was like, I loved my job. I loved going to my job every day. I actually went to day early for my job one day. So, um, but yeah, I really, really liked that work. So, but it wasn't paying the bills. It wasn't paying the mortgage. It wasn't paying everything as a relief counselor. So I decided to go to university. And so when I went to university, I was, I was going full-time university and I was going full-time work. And my sister said, you keep it up, you're gonna get burnt out. Very next day, gone. And I, I lost my job, I lost university, and back on welfare again. So this is not a pity talk, of what I'm telling you. It's a reality of mine. But if I'm here, all those out there, they're struggling. It's a struggle to get up every day and, and try and plug your way through society and society's judgments and things like that. Well, I believe like if somebody's business is none of my business, that's why I feel like if you're doing whatever with your check, that's your business. It's none of my business. And, and I, you know, I, I just feel that way. So um, the basic income part I think is important. However, I, wouldn't, I don't think it, it's enough. Like you have to add on like a peer support or something like that with not everybody, because not everybody's in that uh, frame of mind to even go to work because they're so down. They get so down that it's like major to get up. And I, I know it's true because I've experienced it a lot. So um, I just wanted to say that um, you know, I hope I, when you were talking and discussing and, and everything counselors, and I, and I was listening, it's, it's really not quite simple what Lori's asking. Lori's asking for a, a, a vote of conscience. Like, do you believe that this kind of monies can help people move forward? And it can, but it's up to them, it's, it's not up to us. It's up to individuals how far they can you know, go with what they want to do. But having an opportunity with that to get work, like to actually train and, and that kind of thing, I really think that is uh, a key part of that uh, program working for people. And like I said, it's not for everybody, but it, the opportunity should be available for the people to you know, get out, because it's not easy to get out. Like I said, I'm still in, I'm on ODSP. So um, I kind of went over the top there, but um, uh, is my five minutes off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Your anyway. worship, if I could. Yes, Councillor Campbell. I've done my homework. It takes three generations for a family to get out of welfare. Three generations. Exactly what this woman has gone through, and she's still going through it. This is something that is not going to happen at the local level it has to happen at the provincial federal level uh, uh, i'm sorry councillor uh, patel it, patel it's uh, got nothing to do with the council this this needs to move forward okay thank you councillor councillor lacoco thank you mr mayor i'll, I'll just wrap up and say that the idea behind this is um, approving the concept of a basic income at a federal and provincial level. We have to do something different because what we, we're doing right now is not working. Um, the idea is not to spend more money, it's to spend money effectively and more efficiently. I gave you a list of those programs and there's tons more at all different levels. So the idea is spend more effectively and efficiently. The idea is to say to the provincial and federal government that we are concerned, we do support, support the idea of a basic income, you do all of the work, you come up with the, the ideas, the concepts, the programs, and then present them. I can't do that, I don't have the information, I don't have the experience to do that, but it's to support the federal and the provincial government to do that. Thank you. Are there any other comments of council? Do we have any speakers? Pardon me? Do we have any more speakers? Uh, is there any, any other speakers, Mr. Uh, no, nope, no other speakers. Um, so now that everyone's spoken, I'm gonna throw in my two cents as well. Um, are we okay? Okay. Um, so I, I like the concept of helping and maybe realigning. Maybe what we're doing isn't working, but my concern is with the motion, it says things like, 
that we're asking the government to, to implement this and to implement it's it's used in at least two of the resolution points and i would i would want to before we implement anything i'd like to model it I, and i and i agree the concept is good i support the concept but not implementation because i don't know how it's going to play out i did some quick cursory research or there's a cbc story out there saying this will cost 85 billion dollars the first year and and i know one thing after serb like I, I don't know how I would describe it, but man, it caused a lot of conflict for, there's a lot of unfilled jobs, uh, a lot of people waiting for their checks to arrive, a lot of abuse took place, and I know firsthand of a number of situations, and then we, they called it the great resignation after, no one wanted to work, and, and I'm concerned about that as well, and I don't want to look at one thing in isolation without the other, and we need to know, and I, I know earlier, Councillor, you said it's impossible to say what the cost is, we have to know uh, at least a uh, modeling. And that's why I, I support the idea, I supported a living wage, I supported that, and the idea of a basic income, I support the concept of it, but not without the research, not without the modeling, and not without the concept, and that's the part that concerns me. I mean, in that video, I like the video, it was interesting, but a lot of things that we had that were supposed to save us time, vacuums, refrigerators, cell phones, uh, computers, the 40 hour work week, flex weeks, and they said, oh, this is gonna make things, but we're just busier. And I think it doesn't matter what things, what conveniences we had, we're just busier. So I think I'd be more comfortable if the wording was amended rather than implementing. I, I don't wanna implement anything until I know the ramifications, but I do like the concept. So I just wanted, those are my, now that everyone else has said their piece, I had to say my piece. I don't wanna direct the discussion. I just wanna add to it. Where is the word implement so you can point me to it, please? Well, it's in B and it's in C. See the word implement? Yes, yep, B and C. There, there, I have so many documents. And going back to that 85 billion, I have another statistic that says that um, once you take the 85 billion, it, it will go down to 3 billion. So it, again, it's those are articles and not um, program presentations to show everything. You know, you can read all these different articles and I've read so many of them, there's all these different amounts. So again, we have to ask. So if the word implement is the issue. Well, that's just for me. I don't know, I can't speak for well, anyone if, else. Well, if, yeah. if that's what the issue is with other counselors, um, if we remove the word implement from B to um, research. Yeah, research is fine, model, uh, you know, like research I, and provide models that would be fine with yeah, you. Yeah, even even pilot projects. Some like actually. Well, there's already been pilot programs, so now they have to take that back and and right crunch those numbers. Right, they, model it more, Yeah, we don't need more pilot yeah. programs. And in C as well, it says um, toward implementing. It says again, both of them implementing. And I don't know that I I can support implementing until I've seen the okay, you know the I, empirical I can, data and, and that, modeling. Yeah. Okay, so in C. Um, um, towards researching it, that can be in there as well. If the rest of council are okay with the words of implement to researching, because that's what I'm asking for. It, they have pilot programs and there's many different models they can do. What they're going to come up with, I don't know. And you know, you read this article, you read this article. I've read so many articles, I got all these numbers floating around in my head mm -hmm. from, from different pilot programs. You have pro programs in the US that they did. There's just so many, so we need our government provincially and federally to look at it. And that's basically why, why I brought this forward. Okay, I've got, uh, so thank you for that. I've got Councillor uh, Patel wants to jump in again. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I would not be supporting this motion. It's not a right time in Canada right now because UBA sounds like a really good concept, but currently I'm not sure if uh, the municipalities that have supported this uh, initiative or even Councillor Coco has looked at our current financial uh, position for our country. We are in $1.2 trillion debt as of now as a uh, country of Canada. Taxpayers are paying $3.5 billion per month just in an interest. Could you imagine how many housing we can build with just one month of interest? The second carbon tax just kicked in Ju July 1st, and it, that increasing cost of everything, everything that is made, shipped, or any services that are provided on top of the already record high prices we are paying for everything. We all know the Bank of Canada raised the interest rate to 5%, and that's gonna go significant higher. 
in future. And lastly, billions of Canadian dollars are being sent to sent out uh, out of the Canada without any direct benefit to Canadians. I worry ab about my kids, my grandkids' future. I worry about the future of Canada. If we as society don't do something to cut government spending, the inflation rate will outpace everybody's income. This UBF proposal will increase everyone's tax and this could have, have very opposite and negative impact on everyone's life. I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the cost and impacts before we can even consider that. As you said, Mr. Mayor, it's going to be $85 billion projected, but we all know when government gets to something, it's always double the cost than what they said number they say. So hypothetically, it's going to cost us about $96 billion a year. And anybody who get, I'm not pointing finger at anyone, but where is the money going to come from? Taxpayers. End of the day, there's only one taxpayer. And when you keep on increasing taxes, the taxpayer who's working hard is going to eventually give up, and they're all going to line up to receive this universal basic income. What's going to happen? Where are they going to get the money from? So we got to look at those whole, the whole big picture. So the concept might sound good on the paper, but it is not realistic, and Canada cannot, cannot afford this concept. So I am completely against that. Your Worship, if I can. Yes, go ahead, Councillor. The money's already being spent. What we need to do is have the federal and provincial governments look at a different way of spending it to help those in need. It's not a new expense going to be thrown on our shoulders as taxpayers. It's already being spent right now. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Baldinelli and then Councillor Patel. Through you, Mayor. <clears throat> I agree with your changes that you made on the proposal. Um, I support any kind of research for making things more efficient. Just like uh, Councilor Campbell has stated, the money is already being spent. Um, we already owe a lot of money from past governments misspending money. That's why we have such, we're in debt. You know, you always spend money you don't have and that's what we continue to do. So anything that we can move to progress uh, our future, uh, providing people with some kind of basic living, because if you don't, we're just gonna have more and more issues and it's gonna just cost taxpayers more and more money. Uh, just like Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Councilor Coco had stated, that we, had all, we have all these programs and basically just like our, we do with City Council here and through the CAO, we're trying to create efficiencies that'll save everybody money in the future and I think that there's nothing wrong with investigating and researching if this is a possibility or not so I support it. okay thank you for that uh, Councillor Patel well through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Campbell actually I just looked it up and they said this universal income income will cost 96 billion dollars and current services are costing 30 billion dollars as of now so we are still adding $64 billion a year to what we are paying right now. So we all have to look at the numbers. Do we, like one billion is a thousand million. So we gotta understand, it's not 100 million, it's a thousand million. So we gotta know how much it's gonna cost before we support anything. And Canada is not in a great position to support anything. So let alone Ontario, Canada cannot support anything like this. So I urge everybody to please think about your future, your kids' future, not just in this council, anybody who's supporting this UBI, please think of what, uh, where we're gonna be in the next 10 years. And if we actually push government to take off the carbon tax, reduce the spending, and we can bring prices of everything down and everybody can afford everything. For example, if we are giving someone 16,000 dollar extra per year cost of everything goes up so money goes in one pocket comes out another pocket how about we work on controlling the rents how we work on the reducing inflation make everything work for everyone remember old days when dad worked in the factory and they can run the family in one person's job and they still live life comfortably why can't we do that anymore because everything costs lots more. And everything costs more because every level of government, not a municipal level because we don't have money to spend, we can't run deficit. Whether it's a regional, 
I'm not sure how regional works, but provincial and federal level, they are spending, they're spending it out of control. And I'm not pointing fingers at any parties, I'm just saying all the governments. They need to stop spending and think about the future, think about the future of the country and their citizens. So uh, I think we have to do proactive approach than just handing out the money, sorry. Okay, thank you for that, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Lacocco? Your, your Worship, I want a recorded vote. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Th this is the challenge that I have with all these figures floating around. The, the numbers that I, I'm just about to speak came from Senator Kim Pate's report, and it says $80 billion in support for a net cost of $3 billion. So this is where, you know, you read one number, you read one number. Senator Pate put this number at the Senate. Th this is the challenge. There's all of these numbers, but it's not those numbers. It's a net cost of $3 billion by replacing tax measures like the GST credit, basic personal amount, as well as provincial territorial social assistance. It does not include future cost savings associated with downstream social and economic benefits such as redactions in health care, reductions in health care, criminal legal system, and emergency shelter spending. It does not include potential economic benefits, 1.8% uh, increase in the real GDP, 346,000 additional jobs plus 52 billion in additional tax revenue after the first five years. That was in Ke uh, Senator Kim Pate's presentation at the Senate, which is coming back in the fall. So that's what I say, there's all of these numbers. We can't make a decision with all of these numbers. We need the provincial and federal government to set clear guidelines with real data and come up with real figures, and that's what I'm asking to do. Okay. Yes, Councillor Patel. That is why we need to know the real cost before we can go ahead with anything. There are so many numbers are floating around. We have to know the real cost before we support anything. Well, I think that's why with me, I'm, I'm okay because this isn't asking them to implement it, but asking them to research it, right? And then let's see, what's the real number? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. And I can't, you know, condone a cost until I know what it is. So, um, so why don't we then call this vote? And Mr. Clerk, it's a recorded vote, and it's, it's the resolution before us with the changes the words uh, implement has been removed and replaced with research? Research and re researching for number C. Research and researching for C. Okay, I think everyone's uh, understanding the motion before them. Uh, we'll start with uh, Councillor Baldinelli. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Neustig. Councillor Patel. Against. And we have Councillors Peter Angelo and Strange absent. Councillor Thompson. No. And Mayor Diodati. <laughs> Boy, you put me on the hot seat. <laughs> I'm going to support this because the word implementing, it's not committing us. And that carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who came out for the uh, vote, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Okay, so now we're gonna, Mr. Clerk, take us back to the agenda where we were. Uh, yes, we'd uh, left off at section eight under reports. Okay, has everybody uh, found their spot? Okay, we're at 8.1, parking fund budget to actual variance. We're looking for, there's a recommendation that the parking fund budget to variance report be received. Motion by Councillor Baldinelli, second by Councillor Neustag. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. 8.2, capital project closing report. There are four recommendations. Uh, first, that council receive the report. Secondly, that we approve the closure of the projects and that council approve the wet weather management program funding adjustment as outlined and council approve the funding swap budget amendments. Looking for a motion from council. Moved by Councilor Thompson, seconded by Councilor Neustag. Well, any discussion, no discussion, all those in favor? Okay, and that's- In favor. Okay, thank you, that's approved. Item in item 8.3, 
2022 development charge treasurer's report. There's a recommendation that we receive the report. Looking, motion by Councilor Baldinelli, seconded by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. In, in favor. Effect. Okay, thank you, Councilor. Uh, item 8.4, cancellation, reduction, or refund of taxes. There's a motion here that we approve the summary report. Looking for a motion to approve the summary report. Moved by Councillor Baldinelli. Seconded by Councillor... Campbell. Campbell, thank you, Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Item 8.5, minor change to zoning bylaw application for Grand Niagara draft plan of subdivision. There are two recommendations and it's staff are asking us to support those recommendations. Mm -hmm. Motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor, no. Uh, I need a seconder first. Can I get a seconder on the floor? Seconded by Councillor Neustag. Speak to the motion, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have an issue with this. I don't think that they're minor changes. When you go from nine meters down to seven meters, 11 meters down to nine meters, six meters down to three, three meters down to 1.2, 30% to 70%, 25 to 15, like it just goes on and on, it's too much. And I don't think that it's a minor adjustment. I think it should be a public meeting. So I, I will be opposed to this. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and Councillor, for the record, Councillor Patel left the meeting uh, because she has a conflict on this issue. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got the motion. Uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, uh, and that's approved uh, with uh, Councilor Lacocco being opposed. Maybe we can I'm get- opposed. And uh, Councilor Campbell's opposed as well. Maybe we can get Councilor Patel uh, back in. Is she, she's good now? She had a Oh, did she have, I don't know which ones. She could come back in. She can come back in, okay. <laughs> At least she wasn't leaning on the door when she just opened it just now. So, listen. to item 8.6, 8.6, uh, official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, minor change to the proposed zoning bylaw. Uh, there are two recommendations by staff they are asking for support. Motion by Councillor Baldinelli, seconded by Councillor, seconded no. by no. Councillor Thompson. No. All those in favor? Okay. In favor. Okay, that's approved, thank you for that. Uh, the consent agenda, What's the, okay, motion yeah. by Councillor Thompson yeah. Yeah. Uh, to move the consent agenda. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Baldinelli. We'll call the vote on the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and in that's favor. A, Thank you for that, that's approved. So now we'll just jump ahead here. And just, I'm just gonna really quickly uh, read out for those that are Listening in, the consent agenda, we approved the um, budget to actual variance report for the tax levy supporting the operating fund. We approved the municipal heritage committee, removal of a property on Dunn Street. The parking control review for Victoria Avenue, Morrison and Simcoe Street is approved. The extension and new contract agreement with the Canadian Corps of Commissioners for parking enforcement services. Uh, the addition of proposed community safety zones where fines are doubled in certain areas. Um, the um, Municipal Heritage Committee proposed exterior restoration of the Via Station on Bridge Street, uh, as well as the Carnegie Library. Um, and the Municipal Register of Heritage Properties, which I talked about earlier. And the 2023 Sports Wall of Fame inductees uh, and that list was all approved through consent. So now we're on item 10, which is communications. Let me just jump ahead in my agenda here. There's a recommendation by our city clerk um, that we can approve and support 10.1 through 10.7 if you wanna do it in block. Uh, motion, uh, Councillor Lococo. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to pull 10.7 rail safety, please. Okay, so, all right, so then we could do 10.1 through 10.6 if you like. Yes. Uh, yeah, Councillor Baldinelli. Okay, we're good with a motion by Councillor Coco, second by Councillor Baldinelli, that we support items 10.1 through 10.6. Um, and uh, they are quickly uh, Niagara Scarman Biosphere Network. 10.2, uh, illumination request for arthritis month. Uh, proclamation request, child care worker and early childhood educator appreciation day. Proclamation request for Pitt Hopkins syndrome. Uh, flag raising request for childhood cancer awareness month. And procla proclamation request, international overdose awareness day. Those are the uh, matters that we'll be voting on for communications. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay. In favor. Okay, and that's approved. And uh, Councilor Coco, you'd like to speak to 10.7 Rail Safety Week request. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, last month, I emailed the CAO to ask where we were on um, the trail train tracks going through the the city, and he said there was no update. Then. Um, a train got stuck for over an hour and we all saw those emails going back and forth. Um, I, I think it's important that we look into this sooner rather than later. I know we've been doing this for years and years and we've talked to CN and we've talked to CP. We have to do something. Like I understand um, the, the, the safety of it. 911 is given different guidelines when, when it's blocked to go in different ways. But it, it's a huge inconvenience to our community and we've talked about this for a number of years. What is our plan moving forward? Like I, I know um, Councillor Gale took over the, the email um, the email thread about why it happened and, and the, the, that sort of thing. But the bigger picture is we still have them here in our city and what are we supposed to do? So I can give you a little bit of an update. I know myself mm -hmm. and Councillor Thompson, you know, have been on this for years. And unfortunately, it goes at a glacial pace. I'll tell you, we have, there's really only two options involved. Number one is we can build, we've got a dozen crossings and, and you can build overpasses and underpasses and the, the prices we were getting before was somewhere in the area 30 to $50 million per overpass or underpass. So off the charts expensive and you have to do at least three or it doesn't impact. So it's gonna be a significant uh, investment. We have discussed the idea with CN and this came up as well at regional council last week, the idea of rerouting the trains around the city. Historically, the CN trains and they have tracks that come through the city that are shared by Via Rail and also shared by Go, Metrolinx. And traditionally, historically, they used to cross in Niagara Falls and go into Niagara Falls, New York. Well, once CP sold their tracks, they sold the bridge, that no longer happens. So now, through a dozen crossings, they come through the city, they meander, they've got a few uh, rail spurs that they use occasionally, and then they exit the city. So our discussion was around reciprocal agreements that CN has with CP and vice versa where they could bypass the city altogether for some of their trains. We did have those discussions. There's a horizontal CP track that goes across the city and crosses over in Fort Erie into Black Rock like all the other trains. Now, that we got a little bit held up because CP is in the process of buying Kansas City South, major railway in the US that goes right down to the Gulf of Mexico. So they're in the process right now and they haven't concluded the sale. I can tell you that we have been in touch with some of the senior people involved in the transaction and we are gonna revisit the idea of the reciprocal agreement and that's just gonna be upon conclusion. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar transaction and uh, I can tell you we've had ongoing dialogue but nothing is gonna happen until it concludes. So those are our two options and uh, I, I think that we do have it. We've had some very positive discussions and dialogue and uh, we've also had a number of upgrades with rail safety and a lot of um, things that we put in place to avoid uh, completely bisecting the city because that's exactly what happens in Niagara Falls. So our ambulance, our police, our fire, you know, we have to be on both sides of the tracks because when it happens, and today the rail lines are much bigger than they used to be, they're three and four kilometer. So unfortunately, they're much bigger and they cause more um, delay and, and it's not just a matter of inconvenience, it's a matter of safety. So those are our two options. We're still pursuing um, all of our discussions with the reciprocal agreement from the CN to the, C, to the CP tracks, and that's where things sit right at the moment. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, any other? So then, uh, can we make a motion then to um, uh, approve 10.7? Okay, motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Baldinelli to support proclamation request for Rail Safety Week for 2023, being September 18th through the 24th. All those in favor? Thank you, and that's approved. In now, favor, uh, yes. Oh, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Uh, 11, communications and comments of the city clerk. City clerk has rec suggested that we receive and file 11.1 through 11.15. Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to pull 11.3, the region's um, correspondence, and 11.10, strong mayor. Okay, so why don't we deal with those first? So 11.3, Niagara Region correspondence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I do have some concerns. I've, I've talked with some residents as well. Um, with the new definitions that will result in less oversight by governing bodies resulting, the, uh, resulting in a lack of due diligence when it comes to dealing with species at risk and the destruction of their habitat. Um, this in particular is concerning to, due to the municipality residing within the Carolinian zone, an area of conservation concern. So my questions are, how do we as a municipality make sure the EIS process is being done properly and will not result in conditions of species at risk act being overlooked or stripped? And two, is this over, if the oversight does occur, could it possibly be a result in the liability backlash for the municipality because of proper due diligence was not done? So I'd like to refer this to staff and if we can also get the NPCA's comments because this letter was forwarded uh, to the NPCA but their comments are not attached. So those are my two concerns. Uh, refer it to staff and um, get the NPCA's um, comments to this letter. Okay, and just for you, maybe we can ask uh, uh, Ms. Dolch, our uh, general manager of planning, if she had any insight into the environmental impact statement uh, that Councillor Lecoq was referring to in the regional correspondence. Thank you, Your Worship. So this has, the, the correspondence in front of you has to, it relates to the natural her heritage policies that were released by the province. We do have a report coming to, to council on, on the policies. Um, so we will provide further commentary and we can look to address that. Uh, there is correspondence obviously from the NPCA as well as their review of the natural heritage policies. Uh, just for some guidance, that's on, uh, that was the next item, which was, sorry, it's kind of the, but it was the next correspondence. That was 11.3, and then the next one is 11.4. Yeah, sorry, it is 11.6, 11.6, thanks, Andrew. Um, so there is correspondence on, the, on that about the proposed provincial planning statement and the natural heritage policies. They have comments in there as well. Um, with regard to, to your concerns, obviously we'll, we'll have we'll have further dialogue obviously we don't have any environmental experts on staff uh, we can only provide commentary but we'll have some discussions with the region who do have environmental um, uh, planners on staff thank you i did read this but i didn't realize it was in response to the region three oh. okay thank you so do you want to make that motion then that yes, we refer that, that to refer staff refer to staff to bring back in the report that they were okay bring and a second by can we get a second by councillor baldinelli uh, all those in favor Favor. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, that's done. And then now let's do, um, if we could, 11.1 through 11.15. Uh, no, I had another one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and then we'll get to that one. We'll work sorry. our way through them. So 11.1 uh, through 11.15, uh, can we get a motion to receive and file? Councilor so Newest. Okay, thank you. Uh, moved by Councilor Campbell, seconded by Councilor Newestag. All those in favor? Okay, and that's Thanks. approved. And uh, moving along, um, that's supporting also the town of Fort Erie and their Woodbine Race Day program, as well as a resolution uh, municipality of Gray Highlands. Then we're at 11.6, um, resolution Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Um, let me just call this up here. That's uh, recommended that that be for the information of council. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so we could have done a couple more probably, right? Okay, we're looking to receive and file on 11.6. Motion by Councilor Coco, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's favor. approved. Thank you, uh, that's approved. 11.7, uh, again, another, actually we could have received a lot of these. Uh, 
Resolution City of Woodstock, um, opioid crisis, the recommendation from staff is that we re receive and file 11.7, moved by Councillor Neustag, seconded by Councillor Patel. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Favorite. Thank you. Um, okay, let's do 11.8 and 11.9. Correspondence from the City of Toronto regarding planning and housing and a uh, social issue motion by a local resident regarding the state of emergency on mental health. The recommendation both are from staff that we receive and file. Motion by Councilor Neustag, seconded by Councilor Patel. All those in favor? Okay, in that, favor. Thank you, that's approved. Uh, Councilor uh, Lococo, 11.10, Strong Mayor's Act, summary of changes from our solicitor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have some questions and some clarifications or verifications. Uh, it talks about power to appoint chairs, vice chairs of local boards. Do those local boards include boards outside of the city, such as the library project chair in the airport? You know, that's a great question. I don't know, is Miss, uh, oh, she's here. Oh, great. Oh, great. Um, Miss Pignarty, can you hear us? I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So we've got a question from Councillor Lococo regarding 11. Point ten, the Strong Mayors Act summary of changes, and so she's acting. Oh, go ahead, you can ask it. My, my question about uh, power to appoint chairs and vice chairs of local boards outside of the city. Does that include the library project chair in the airport? I will have to check that and get back to you, Councillor. Um, it will depend on um, the def definitions in the Municipal Act. So to the extent that the local board is defined in a particular way under the Municipal Act, that's what the definition will be, but I just don't want to tell you off the hop. Okay, thank you. The process is within two days that the Mayor can veto in writing. So what happens in those two days? for a resident who wants to go ahead and do something that doesn't know if it's going to be vetoed or not. What, what happens within that two days? And then once the two days hit, how do we notify maybe people that specifically on that or how do we notify the public? Ms. Pignarty, can you help us uh, on that one too? Certainly. So if I understand the question correctly, what happens to a resident, um, the two days is um, the date, um, it's a cooling off period for all bylaws of council. So um, under this new amendment to the Municipal Act, each bylaw will not be effective until the two day period has passed. So that gives an opportunity to exercise the veto powers. But there is an alternative to make certain bylaws or all bylaws effective um, earlier than that, if there's an explicit waiver of the two-day cooling off period. Okay, thank you. Uh, it talks about delegation. Um, the, the mayor can delegate powers. Who would they delegate powers to? Is that staff, other councillors, CAO? Who would be the delegated person? We'll go back to Ms. Pignarty again. Certainly. Um, delegation can occur as it has traditionally occurred under the Municipal Act, Section 23.1. Which allows, I'm sorry, I don't know that section. Who does it allow? So I don't have the Municipal Act open in front of me and that's the challenge. Um, I don't want to give you an answer off the hop. Again, this is an amendment to the Municipal Act to the extent we're talking about definitions. They're already defined in the Municipal Act and there's a practice so I can let you know what the delegation is under Section 23.1. That's great, thank you. Um, and just confirm, it, um, a subject cannot be vetoed at the meeting, it has to wait the two, two days. Ms. Pignarty? I don't understand the question, sorry. Say if there was um, a, a topic here and the mayor didn't want it to go through or wanted it to go through, the mayor cannot veto at the meeting, it has to wait for the two days, is that correct? There's an entire procedure on the veto um, there's an intention to veto, then there's the actual veto with reasons. So all of that would have to be followed. So I don't know what the timeline for that would be, but the procedure is set out in the information memo. Right, and so this, this is the process as I understand it. So today there's August 15th meeting. If, you want to, if the mayor wanted to veto something, they have to give uh, notice within two days. And then within two weeks, the mayor has to give um, the clerk the veto document and then the clerk would give the next day the veto document to council 
and then within 21 days, council would meet to discuss it. So my question is, before that two-day notice, is there an opportunity for a mayor to veto something right in council? I, I know this is laid out, but it doesn't say that it has to happen that way. So I'm asking about that day. I am not sure, sorry. I don't wanna give you an answer off the hop. Again, okay. this is not, um, this information document is not an opinion, it's not an interpretation. It's just a straight summary. Um, and that's all it is. So that, that could that be put on the list of things to check to come back to us then? Certainly. If I can clarify the question, you want to know if um, if a veto can be exercised same day as the meeting? Correct. I don't think so by what I read, but it wasn't firm enough to say that wasn't the case. Okay. Okay. And so, then, sorry, just for clarity, Council, just so I understand the question. Are you saying the written notice of intention to veto because that has to be completed first so and so is it the written note could could the mayor file a written notice of intention on the day of the vote knowing that, that council didn't vote the way that they wanted no, no, to yeah so yeah. could could they could the mayor file that on the day of of the vote okay we'll, we'll check that i just want to make sure yes. that that's the question yes okay thank you so I, I need to understand this because I, I tried to do the math. So we have eight councillors and one mayor. So say an issue had five councillors um, that denied a development. So five and then three councillors were in favor. Say if the mayor wants a development and the veto power, they go through the whole process of veto. So at the, th the three weeks after coming back, it would have to be two-thirds of majority because I keep hearing the strong mayor's power there's two-thirds majority that the council can overturn a mayor is that that's correct right okay so two-thirds so figure that five and three so five five people voted against a development three people wanted a development three weeks later we come back through all of the proper notice in order to get two-thirds six people would have to vote against the mayor which means the three people who wanted it, one of them would have to flip and say no. So that's the math of it, and it doesn't really make sense. Unless, I, I did speak to the CAO before, he said maybe there's new information, so maybe somebody would flip their, their opinion. But if there's no information and it's just, I want something, you don't want something, the math doesn't make sense. So the two thirds to um, veto a mayor isn't applicable with our numbers. You'd have to get somebody who thought differently to come over to your side. Am I understanding that correctly, the math-wise with our number of councillors? It seems that way, 5.28, so I think you have to round up to six, I guess. Uh, I don't think there's two eights is gonna be a number of a councillor. So that's why it'd be nice, and I don't think it's been actually posted, is that correct? Um, that we're still waiting for more clarification from the province? So that's a good question, and I'm sure all councils are made up of different numbers. Exactly. And what's 66.6% .6 of whatever the number is? Yeah. I don't have that. We, yeah. we, so we're those still, are my questions. Yeah, and we're still trying to figure things out, too. So I have questions, I, I, too. I'd, li I'd like to, to look into that more, and I just have um, three more. So under Section F, it talks about um, that we would override and leave the same as the status quo uh, for the organizational structure, the heads of council, the CAO, the chairs, and the vice chairs of board. So my question is, if we leave it the status quo, what is the process that it could be changed? Could it be just changed at the mayor's decision to change it at that point, or does the mayor have to notify, notify in writing a certain time ahead of time? How, how does that status quo change? And I, I'm going to have to go to Ms. Pignardi again. And, and again, I don't, I don't want to get you off the hop again, but uh, is, there, uh, is this something you can answer or not yet? If it's not in the legislation, then I wouldn't be able to tell you. And the legislation did not provide a how-to. It just says that the ability is there with the mayor, so that's what we go with. Okay. Thank you for that. So could, if, if it's not in the legislation, could individual councils put a policy in place to leave status quo unless such and such thing is done, notification and right, I don't know. Could, could there be something put in place for an individual council? Uh, Ms. Pignarty, I'm coming back to you again. <laughs> sure, I'm just looking at this document because I prepared it some time ago before July 1st. So it says under section F, 
unless the mayor wants to change the following items are status quo. So that's straight from the legislation. So it looks like the legislation permits and has stated that there is a status quo unless those powers are exercised. Yes. So there would be no need for a municipal policy when the provincial legislation says that the status status quo is in place. No, no, through the mayor, what I was saying was a policy to change the status quo. So it's status quo right now, but I'm asking, what is the process for a mayor to change the status quo? That's my, my question. Doesn't look like the process has been put in place by the province. It says that there are additional regulations which may be forthcoming. They haven't been published yet. Um, it just says that those the abilities are there with the mayor to change that. Could we put that down as a list to, to follow up on as well? Because there's a lot of um, uh, gray area and ambiguity and I'm just asking questions to understand where it's going. Um, under G, it talks about provincial abilities and fu future regulations. It says any upcoming regulations can be retroactively effective for six months. So the way I looked at it was this retroactive upcoming regulations. So in my mind, I'm thinking a regulation is coming up September 1st to do whatever, and we're in August now. Could the mayor say, well, the regulation's coming September 1st, I want to use it applied in August 15th meeting. Is that, that's how I'm reading it. Is that accurate? I'm back to you, Ms. Pinerti. So the Strong Mayors Act only deals with the exercise of certain powers that advance provincial objectives, right? So they don't apply to everything. It really has to be in connection with prescribed provincial priorities, which right now are building more homes faster and so on. So it's only those um, where the power is clearly exercised for that purpose. It would be that particular bylaw that is retroactively effective for six uh, months. It's not every single bylaw. Thank you, through the mayor. I, I didn't think it was every single bylaw, and I understood it's only per provincially prescribed list. So if it does have to do with housing, my sample was September 1st. Something's coming out September 1st. We're in August 15th today. Can a mayor say, oh, I want to use what's coming out in September for today? That's my question. Because it talks about retroactive, effective for six months. So can you even go back retroactive to a decision that was about building houses in July, retro, that, that, that's my question. So we can put that on the list then too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the last report. one. There'll be a report to the report, Ms. Pinerti. Be. So I, I, I don't want to come back with something where I've all, already answered the question. I think I already answered your question about the need for a policy. I don't think there's a need for the policy. My legal interpretation is where that the statute is very clear. I don't think there would be a need for an additional municipal policy. And on this, retroactive effectiveness for six months is very clear to me. I don't know what else I could offer in a forthcoming report. I have a note of some of the other questions and before I sign off I'm going to repeat the list that I have but I'm not I'm I'm not respectfully inclined to put again in writing what I've already told you verbally. Can we get an example of what the yeah. retroactive would be then because I, I'm just not understanding it. I think the CAO wants to weigh in on this one as well. Yeah I think what staff could do is we could provide some examples because again it's with housing situation so I think you know, a lot of the premise of the strong mayor uh, powers from the provincial authority, you have to think about the logic behind it. Um, there's lots of councils who, uh, di who do not approve certain uh, developments for local reasons that get overturned at OLT. So the purpose of the strong mayor powers is to say, listen, if you know you're going against a provincial regulation, don't waste everybody's time and money and energy just to do something that makes sense politically. So it gives that ability for, so again, if you know that there's a regulation coming into effect that you're gonna lose at OLT, that's where some of that is. So I think what we'll do is we'll give some, some examples uh, of use. Everyone is feeling their way through this. So I think the best thing we can do is provide some examples uh, of it where it may be considered uh, on, on each of those with the caveat that the regulations aren't out yet. So we are, uh, there's been a number of professional level calls between treasurers associations and that kind of stuff where everyone's trying to, to figure this out. So I think when we'll give back a clarification, I think we'll put some hardcore examples of, uh, 
you know, of planning matters that relate to housing and how this could uh, potentially uh, impact it. Okay, that would be great, thank you. And when I'm thinking about the retroactive part, quite often when we've had uh, <coughs> building developments come, um, if it was after our housing plan of 40% affordability, we can't go back to the old ones to say you need to do 40%. So that's why I'm asking about this retroactive, that could you go back to specific developments based on something that's coming. So I'll go past that. And my last one is, can we get a list of what the prescribed priorities are? Like I know it's about building houses, um, but a lot of things can say, well, if we do this, this, and this, we're gonna be able to build houses. Or you know, transportation is about building houses, infrastructure is about building houses. What are the, what is the prescribed list? Is there a list? It's our question as well to the province and nobody has answered it on the province's end for the municipalities. Like our CAO said, we're all trying to figure it out. It is brand new legislation. Um, none of it has been, like we haven't seen a lot of examples of it taking effect as it is so brand new and it has only recently been expanded to additional municipalities. Uh, so we're still we're still, um, we, we are presuming that the provincial priorities are all of these changes related to Bill 23, but that is just a reasonable professional presumption we've come up with. We've asked for a list, but it's not available in that way. Um, the legislation says provincial priorities may be prescribed from time to time, but they haven't been provided to us in that format. Okay. Um, th thank you, Mr. Mayor, CAO, and Ms. Pignarti. Um, as a councillor, we know less than all of you do, so we look at a report very different than you, and when we don't understand or there's gaps in there, that's why I'm bringing up the questions. We, we don't understand. No problem, do. and thank you. Just um, for my indulgence, as I said to you, I will review the list of questions, councillor. So the definition of local boards under the Municipal Act, I will come back to you with that. Um, what which staff can be delegated to under section 23.1 of the Municipal Act. I'll come back to you on that. Um, can a notice of intention to veto be exercised on the same day as the council meeting where the matter is being discussed and the bylaws initially passed? Um, you did ask about the policy. I mean, I will look at it, but I really think that the way the legislation reads, it is just that ability and no process has been provided in terms of how that can be exercised. Um, again, this is one of those new areas for all municipalities. We haven't really seen examples of this particular power being exercised yet in that way under that particular section. Um, you asked about examples of retroactive six months on certain things. Again, examples of this particular legislation are likely limited, but we'll try and find something similar. And I hope that addresses your list of questions. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. That's great. Thank you very much, Ms. Pignarti. Um, maybe we can get, uh, so Councillor uh, Lacocco, do you want to receive uh, the report? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. And seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Councillor Campbell, you still with us? In favor. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I see we got Councillor Crater there too. He's involved. He's still there. He must be bored. I see he's online. No, he's online. I see him on the list here. You can't, I can't sleep, he's just tuning in. Okay, we're at 11.11. .11. Uh, we're looking just to receive and file. It's a zoning bylaw amendment, um, changing a parcel of land from open space to rural <coughs> agriculture. Looking for a motion to receive and file. Mm -hmm. Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you, thank you. 11.12, there's a memo regarding the McBain Community Center hours. So now we're gonna be open Sundays from 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. starting September the 10th. Right. Yeah. Motion by yeah. Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor yeah. Newestag. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Favorite. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moldenhauer. Uh, item 11.13, City of Ottawa is donating a decommissioned ambulance to St. John's Ambulance, I believe to go to Ukraine. Receive. Receive and file by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? That's approved, Fair. thank you, oh, thank you. 11.14, uh, uh, Michael Allen has requested council pass a deeming bylaw under the Planning Act that lots, uh, three lots will no longer be lots within I the registered said, plan of subdivision. Yeah, I'll move that. Motion by Councillor Thompson, yeah. seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. Opposed. Uh, with Councillor uh, Lococo opposed. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? In okay. favor. 
that's approved. Thank you. 11.15 um, uh, comments from resident. I don't have this in my. Uh, so is this just to receive, uh, Mr. Clerk, or? Yeah, the recommendation there is to receive and file. Uh, there's numerous comments there for various parts of the agenda. Okay, looking for a motion to receive and file. Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? Okay, that's yeah. unanimous. That's unanimous, thank you. We're on to item 12, communications and comments of the city clerk. 12.1, recognition of an event of municipal significance and noise bylaw exemption. So we have a few. Um, maybe I can just run through them and we can do them in a sweep. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah, first one is Niagara Falls Night of Art, which will be Thursday, September the 21st. Then we've got the Mighty Niagara Film Festival Niagara to play a Daredevil's Advocate on Wednesday, August the 16th. And we've got the Mighty Niagara Film Festival Showdown in Silvertown, Friday, August the 18th. And um, we've also, yeah, so those are the three noise bylaw exemptions. A motion by Councillor Lococo, seconded by Councillor Neustag. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Item 12, uh, 12.4, Niagara United Soccer Club is having their 50th anniversary. There's a request to waive the bylaw for a food truck. Uh, looking for a motion to support that. Oh, yeah. Councillor Thompson, yeah. seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? That's Thank approved. You. Approved. Thank you for that, Councillor. And then uh, 12.5, memo from Niagara Transit Commission regarding WeGo delivery agreement expiration. And the recommendation is that we refer this to our staff. So looking for a motion to move. Okay, moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Patel, that we refer 12.5 to our staff. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. And then resolutions. Um, so we don't need to go in camera, we've already done that resolution. And uh, Mr. Clerk, can you walk us through the resolution so I don't screw this up? Yeah, so the 13.1, this is a resolution to go in camera on November 21st. I know it seems like it's uh, quite early, but this is just to keep in line with the number of meetings that will be coming up uh, to discuss the uh, Council's budget for, for 2024. Um, so that resolution is for uh, November 21st. Uh, the reason that we're asking for that in, uh, ahead of time is just to make sure that it's covered in an open session since there is uh, no regular meeting of council scheduled that day. Uh, the next resolution there uh, is for a resolution for uh, November 28th where council would be calling a special meeting and this again is to deal with, uh, with the budget process. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion on both of those. Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor Neustag, uh, that uh, number one, we go in camera on November the 21st, and number two, that we have a special council meeting on November the 28th to deal with the budget. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Councillor Campbell, you good? I'm in favor. I'm just making sure you're awake, that's all. I'm here. Okay. I'm uh, to do business. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> okay, so uh, we already did 15.1. Oh, oh, yeah, sir, go ahead, uh, Mr. Clerk. The last resolution, 13.3, uh, yeah. is a resolution uh, regarding planning matters. Okay, and lastly, there's a resolution 13.3, and are we asking for um, support to approve the resolution? Is that right? Yes. Mr. Okay. So uh, looking for a motion for 13.3. Councillor Neustag and second by Councillor Patel. All those in favor? In favor. Okay. Well, what is, what, what? Uh, anyone opposed? Uh, Councillor Lococo opposed? Okay, and. What, uh, what is that? Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, we've got a Councillor Thompson to start requesting uh, what that one is on 13.3. I believe in the past these resolutions uh, are being sought so that uh, planning staff can uh, go ahead with uh, with the matter as opposed to waiting for the minutes to pass at the next meeting. Uh, maybe Count or, uh, General Manager Dolch could explain further. Ms. Dolch. Um, Thank um. you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, this resolution has to do with um, the Empire um, Zoning Bylaw Amendment that we just considered early on in, in the reporting. And generally, it's, it's that council's considered it minor in, in nature and that no further public meetings required in Section 34 of the Planning Act. Got it. 
So you're in favor of that, Councilor Thompson? You're good yes. with that? Okay, yes. that's good. So that was a. Okay, okay. So conflict by Councilor Patel, um, and opposition by Councilor Lococo, and otherwise approval. So we got that one. And then, uh, Mr. Clerk, ratification of in camera. Oh uh, yes, just uh, two motions coming out of uh, ratification from in camera. Firstly, the council accept an offer to purchase part of Cooks Mills Road, being parts two and four of Plan 59R17616 for $3,900 plus HST. And secondly, the council accepts an offer to purchase part of Cooks Mills Road, being parts three and five of the same registered plan number 59R17616 for four thousand three hundred dollars plus HST. Okay, motion to uh, approve in camera. Mo motion by Councilor Patel, second by Councilor Newiste. All those in favor? Okay, that's favor. good. Thank you. Unanimous. And then now we move to sixteen. So sixteen point one. We have a notice of motion by Councilor Patel. Uh, do we need to do anything on this one, Mr. Clerk? Um. Uh, yeah, the notice of motion would not be up for discussion. Right. Uh, we should sure. just uh, uh, vote to uh, accept it and move it to motions for the next meeting. Okay, so you want to accept that, uh, Councilor Neustag, uh, second by Councilor um, Baldinelli. <laughs> All those in favor? Well, in no, favor. I, I want to. Yeah, go, yeah I, thank you. I think you said this to, to the Parks Commission. Uh, no, this is just this is just going to be about adding another exemption to be able to use fireworks. Oh, that's okay. all it is. That's okay. all it is. Okay, thank you for that. So now we're into new business. Councilor Lacoco. Your Worship, if I could. Oh, I'm sure. What was that, Councilor Campbell? If I could. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Campbell, and then we got Councilor Lacoco right after. I'm sure everyone's aware of the fact that uh, I've been complaining about the newspapers being. Uh, left at the end of driveways in gardens and such. Yes. And rather than uh, reinvent the wheel, I've discovered that Fort Erie is about three steps ahead of what I had expected to do tonight. And I would ask that staff contact Fort Erie. Uh, they're gone to the point of almost making it legislative through bylaws that it be delivered to the porch. So if, wow. if staff could do that, that would be awesome. Okay, so they'll take that as direction to staff, Councillor Campbell. Thank you. No, that's great, that's great, great idea. Especially, I, I've had a couple chewed up in my snowblower. Uh, oh, well, that's the whole point, Fort Erie. Uh, snowblowers are getting destroyed. Yep, yep, the, the pin blows out. Yeah, the shearing pin gets, uh, yeah. So, and as a former St. Catherine Standard paper boy, I did the same, always, saying, and shopping news. I did shopping news too, I just wanna point that out too. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Campbell. So I've got Councillor Lococo, then Patel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Quite a few residents contacted me about our summer meetings at 1 p.m. They felt that it was very inconvenient to have a meeting in the middle of the day when they worked compared to if the other one started at four and then five o'clock. Um, so I wanted to bring that and I know um, the other comment was that our meetings are becoming very, very long and I brought this up before about um, our, our list of scheduled meetings and you've always said we can add one. Well, we don't add meetings, we just sit here for you know seven <laughs> hours and go through that. So I wanted to bring that up just because sta um, residents are feeling A, one, one o'clock is very um, inconvenient and I know this is our last one o'clock one, so it's not really gonna matter, but maybe for next year, and um, that maybe we should have more meetings, and some municipalities have their planning meetings separate. Our planning meetings are part of our meeting, um, so they separate it, and then that makes it not as long as well. So I wanted to bring those up for um, maybe staff to come up with some options. I don't know if other people are feeling that way, but those are some of the comments from the residents. And even as a, a, a counselor sitting here for a long number of uh, hours going through many, many pages for an agenda, maybe we could do it in a different way. Well, I can tell you, I haven't been around before when we did do more separation. 
I personally, I love dealing with everything in one night. I love it, get it done, and it's easier on staff. I can tell you, and I'm not gonna point out any specific city councils or town councils, but some of them meet every week, and staff, all they're doing is writing reports, and it's taxing on them. And this way, they're at, now they got time to actually get some things done. Well, let's have the discussion all day long, and when we need meetings, absolutely. But uh, I can tell you, we should also make sure we ask staff how they feel about it, because uh, I'm curious to get their input. Thank you, that, that would be very good to get the report. And you know, it's not just from a resident's perspective, not just council, but staff, so get a report with some, some ideas, options, or you know, maybe stay the same. And my second one is um, online voting. For the election for 2026, a lot of residents have talked about online voting. We have a lot of time between now and then. Um, I was wondering if we could um, look into what the process is, what the cost is, are we able to, um, if, if our CAO could, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the regional clerks are meeting uh, to standardize a format uh, for alternative voting measures. So the, when the regional clerks have completed their, and I'm looking at Bill, I think you guys are in the process still of looking at the evaluation for that. Mr. Clare? Yeah, so through the uh, CAO meetings and the local area clerks meetings uh, throughout Niagara, uh, we're looking for ways for 2026 to uh, improve and share cost efficiencies and one of the matters would be online voting. Uh, there is a separate committee uh, being put together, which I'll be a part of, uh, where we will look to uh, put together a shared RFP for online voting for 2026 that all uh, regional municipalities uh, through Niagara, um, sorry, lower tier municipalities throughout, throughout the region of Niagara could participate in. That's great, thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got Councilor Lecoq, uh, uh, sorry, Patel. Mr. Mayor, I have a couple of items on the new order of business. The first one is regarding the co recent complaint we received from a resident about trailer parking on the private driveway. After, sp after speaking to that resident and other residents who actually have a trailers and RVs parked on their driveway, I called our bylaw department and asked them why did they receive the notice. And he told me that last year council passed the motion that said that you can only park RVs or trailers on your property for only 14 days. I would like to propose that we, re we revisit that uh, bylaw and ask our parking and, by and bylaw uh, officers to come back with the report. Because RVs and trailers do come in different shapes and sizes. Some of the trailers are like little trolleys, some RVs are, I guess, is as big as the driveways, and some RVs are their pop up trailer, pop up campers. So I would like to have a clear understanding on what we are dealing with so we can answer the residents' concerns better. So okay. I would like to have a report come back to council from the bylaws and parking department. Now, how do you want to do this as, a, as direction to as staff or how do you guys want to deal with it, Mr. CAO? Uh, I believe that would have been last term yeah. of council because this usually comes up as an issue during the summer. Uh, no, it wouldn't, wouldn't be reconsideration. Okay. We can take it as a report. Okay. Yeah, we'll take, we can come back to it as a report. Okay. 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 It's, just a re it's just to revisit that thing to get the report. Yep. Yeah, we'll take this after. Okay. Yep. And second thing is, I would like to introduce a resolution, is to direct staff to draft the letters or resolutions similar to City of St. Catharines and City of Coral regarding returning Paul Bernardo to maximum security. Everyone in this chamber is well aware of the unspeakable, unimaginable act against the French and Mahaffey families. I personally was not here, but I have heard so many stories that I don't want to have to do the research. I know what exactly happened because people who lived in the city, they went through horror during that time and people still remember those facts very fondly nowadays. Not fondly, but it's still it's in their memories that they can get rid of. And for me, as uh, being a mother of two girls, I can't imagine any, any family going through this, especially reliving those events with the recent prison transfer. That is why public must not forget and keep those girls' face and memories alive in their heart. We also must join the growing number of municipalities to push back against the federal government and correctional services and help that individual return to maximum security. That individual and criminals that commit unspeakable acts like this should never ever be allowed to see the outside of maximum level prison. I would like to direct staff to draft a resolution similar to other municipalities and join the momentum to get 
that person back to maximum security. I refuse to say his name more than once, sorry. I would encourage every municipality in a region to send a letter to the authorities because we will only return if every municipality joins the cause. Thank you. Okay, can we do that as direction? Uh, oh yeah, yes sir, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I did receive that, uh, that resolution from the city of Thorold. Uh, it was after our, our uh, agenda had gone out. So what we could do is bring that forward on the next agenda uh, and look for council's support uh, for that resolution since it's already been drafted. So we could be uh, uh, consistent in that approach. Thank you for that. Uh, any other new business? I'm looking for a mo Oh, I just want to remind everybody, I know I mentioned earlier, Sunday, September the 10th, from noon until four, it's gonna be the funnest time ever, hanging out with the mayor at the Serbian grounds, continuing on the tradition that Councillor Thompson started long time ago when he was the mayor. So uh, come on out, there's gonna be food, fun, and family, and free. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Sunday, September the 10th. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna send something to everybody. Yep, yep, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> That's it. Motion for adjournment by Councilor. Oh, bylaws. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Bylaws, uh, Councilor Thompson, will you give the bylaws? Since Councilor Peter Angel is not here today, this is the first, will you give, make a motion to give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading? Yeah. Motion by Councilor Thompson and second by. No, actually, I'm against 2023 uh, 076, 2023-077, and have, I, I have conflict with 2023-079 and 2023-080. Did you get all that, Mr. Clerk? Yep. Yes, and do uh, you have some um, as well, Councillor Lococo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm opposed to 2023-079 uh, and 2023-080. Got it, okay. Uh, yes, Councillor Lococo. Yes. Uh, new stake, sorry. <laughs> I'm all confused, I don't know who you are. <laughs> sorry, Councillor New I know. Councillor New um, Estate. 2023-076 um, and 2023-079. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank Okay, Councillor Baldinelli, do you have any you want to declare as well? No, no you're no. good? So could you second uh, Councillor Thompson's motion? Okay, we'll call the vote on uh, on all the bylaws. All in favor? Okay, and that's approved with your exemptions yes. okay. and conflicts. Okay, great. Motion for adjournment, Councillor Thompson. Seconded by Councillor Neustag. All those in favor? We're done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.